Subcommittee will come to order, and good morning. I want to welcome uh, everyone to uh, today's hearing. This is a hearing on a matter that needs oversight. It is the Federal Transit Administration's implementation of the Capital Invis Invi Investment Grant, or the CIG program. This hearing is necessary, not only because it's timely, but because we are now hearing from many transit agencies, from mayors, from local officials, uh, uh, questions that we simply must answer. They say to us they are frustrated by the slow pace and the needless bureaucracy. Now, here's a program that has money and so you can imagine the frustration when that money is not getting to where it's needed. They say they can't get communication uh, so that they can understand how to proceed and what is slowing up this program. And they say they are especially delayed in uh, project approvals. Now, what is happening here? Surely this isn't deliberate, but then we are left to believe that, uh, that uh, the administration doesn't know how to handle this program. So we need to come to grips with the pro problems today, particularly since trans uh, transit is associated uh, with the backbone of uh, urban areas, uh, this committee uh, has a long tradition uh, that is bipartisan of paying attention to matters that, that are important to rural areas, such as bridges and barges that farmers need to get their products to market. In the same way, we expect attention to uh, transit, we are aware, of course, that that is mostly an issue for urban America, but increasingly, we're talking about the metropolitan areas as well. We're not simply talking about big cities. Uh, America is clustered around these metropolitan areas. The CIG program has long enjoyed strong bipartisan support. We authorized it in the FAST Act at $2.3 billion per year. In the same way, the House Appropriations Committee has strongly supported the CIG program by appropriating fundings. And they have appropriated fundings generally well above the authorized level because of the high demand for the project. That's pretty unusual. Therefore, any slow up in this project has got to be explained by the administration. Why hasn't the uh, administration uh, moved this program more rapidly? Uh, the budget requests for the CIG program from the administration have been, to say the least, anemic and the administration of the CIG program has created many challenges. So, so it looks like a program that should be going along well is failing at both ends. Uh, the FTA sent a dear colleague letter to transit agencies that created a lot of confusion. Uh, they expressed fears of higher project costs and more bureaucratic challenges. For example, until this dear colleague, the FTA had allowed project sponsors to decide whether a TIFIA loan paid back with local dollars would count as local or federal funding. FTA now demands that all TIFIA funds be counted as federal share no matter who actually pays for the loan. Now, that's ridiculous. So we've got to have some answers on, on matters like that. 
In its Dear Colleague, FTA states that it will consider geographic diversity as a factor in FTA funding. But the F FTA seems intent on spreading uh, a very little amount of money very quickly over the entire nation. That does not reflect the reality of how cities, and again, I stress metropolitan areas, uh, grow. Uh, they are expanding at a rapid pace and should not be penalized uh, because of multiple projects in the CIG pipeline. Uh, if we're going to keep up with this growth, this very rapid growth, we're going to have to make big investments in transit. Uh, the, is this deliberate slowing of the CIG program, or is it rank inefficiency? The House passed the, trans, the Transportation Appropriation Bill, which addressed many of the issues and others I expect will be raised at this hearing. When this committee reauthorizes the FAST Act, you can be sure we will also carefully review the CIG program and, and if necessary, we will amend F, uh, Section 5309. I'm going to ask the ranking member for his, rank, for his comments. Uh, well, thank you. I just really appreciate the opportunity, Madam Chair, to be here. And, you know, districts like mine that are not in urban areas, we still have transit needs, too. Uh, the district I represent in central Illinois is one that, uh, is one that, that brings in uh, a lot of transit issues in and around the public universities in Champaign-Urbana, Bloomington Normal, even in Springfield, Illinois, and down in the Metro East around Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. Uh, transit's necessary. Uh, my concern today is how do we effectively bring in some of what I consider the many urban areas into the transit programs uh, like the uh, capital investment grant program and, and what we do to ensure that there is a capability to provide those services in non-major urban areas, but also the ability to serve those customers and be able to market that, uh, that product. So thank you for having the, the opportunity to be here. This is our, our fourth hearing uh, as we continue to work to reauthorize the Federal Service Transportation, uh, Federal Tr Service Transportation Policies. And I wanna thank the, the chair of this subcommittee and also Chairman DeFazio for their leadership and their bipartisanship on this issue. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member Davis. I'd like to ask Mr. DeFazio, the chair of the full committee, if he has any opening statement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I do. Um, you know, I had uh, uh, some optimism uh, that we would be looking at a major infrastructure package in partnership uh, with the President and the White House. Uh, and, you know, I, the first blow to those hopes was uh, back actually in the, the uh, 2018 budget request uh, when uh, the President's budget uh, proposed essentially to eliminate the, the CIG program. Uh, you know, the uh, Congress responded and we said no uh, on a bipartisan basis and appropriated a record amount of funds, $2.6 billion. Uh, to run the program as the law requires. And similar in 2019, yet another Mulvaney proposal to essentially eliminate the program, and uh, yet another bipartisan response from Congress to uh, appropriate $2.5 billion into the program. Um, you know, the, uh, back in 17, uh, there was, was tremendously uh, disruptive. Um, and basically all of the pending projects uh, were canceled. Now, this is a bit odd because, uh, you know, the, uh, the assertion by DOT was that the, the, this was administration policy. Now, everybody knows that uh, president's budgets are not policy. They are merely a suggestion to the United States Congress, and Congress holds the power of the purse. So a suggestion by the president or an ideologue running uh, the president's office or OMB or whatever Mulvaney's running these days, both, everything, uh, is not a law and cannot supersede 
the law. Ideology does not supersede the law. Now, I, I have read the testimony here uh, from the acting administrator, and it paints a very rosy picture uh, for SIG, uh, but I don't think things are quite uh, as rosy as uh, is purported there. The, uh, uh, earlier this year, um, you know, we uh, sent a letter to FTA and transit agencies uh, looking data uh, that allow us to look at the, the SIG program operation under the FAST Act. That's another one of our duties here is to oversee the laws that have been implemented and see that they're being properly followed. Now, if we use uh, that data, um, you know, despite what I keep hearing and heard from uh, the president's previous infrastructure advisor, uh, DJ Gribben, that the only problem was the environmental review process, and that's what was slowing everything down, and this administration was going to uh, streamline things. Actually, if we look at the first slide, uh, SIG projects have nearly doubled uh, in uh, the delays uh, for approval. Uh, entry into engineering, 135 to 289 days. Full funding grant agreements, 172 to 391. Uh, SSGA 112 243. Everything is more than doubled. Uh, you know, so now to get a new start project through uh, to the final phase is uh, 391 days, more than a year. Small starts 243 days, uh, and this covers the entire period of the Fast Act, and uh, certainly I think reflects that things are not uh, as uh, rosy as is purported. Uh, secondly, uh, staff found. Uh, that the actions since 2017 have resulted in 845 million, almost a billion dollars in extra costs. The risk assessment process added 650 million, and the delays uh, cost about another 200 uh, million. Uh, then third, the staff found that the SIG cost share for new starts has shrunk dramatically. Uh, it's clear that transit agencies are feeling pressured um, by the administration. Uh, you know, again, uh, the ideological proposals of Mr. Mulvaney and D.J. Grimman, uh, now gone, uh, was that uh, we were going to shrink uh, the share that would be paid by the federal government and increase the burden on the local governments. And if you look here, uh, it was a nearly 50 percent SIG cost share uh, pre-17. Uh, now it's below 36.6, and that's because uh, the uh, administration has... Uh, basically sent a message that if you ask for more than 40 percent, you're not going to get approved or you're going to get a very low uh, rating. Uh, this uh, unofficial policy or whatever this is uh, directly is contrary to 49 U.S.C. section 5309L5 uh, and the uh, fiscal year 2019 Omnibus Appropriations Act uh, and which uh, said that the FDA is not authorized to require a local match more than a project uh, that is more than 49 percent of the project cost. Fourth, staff found FTA had del has delayed the use, the use of streamlining tools. Now that's just extraordinary for an administration that was going to get all these barriers out of the way. I mean, if we want to repeal an environmental law, we can streamline that. If we want to get transit grants out, well, no, we, we really can't do that. Um, approvals for a letter of no prejudice uh, took 44 percent longer than under the previous administration. Uh, and, uh, you know, these, uh, these letters allow work to begin on a project earlier, which, as we all know, the sooner you can initiate a project, uh, the greater the cost savings, as long as it's well planned. And, uh, you know, we've heard from multiple transit agencies that are absolutely desperate to get a letter of no uh, uh, prejudice because of the potential cost savings. Uh, and so it's uh, vexing and, uh, you know, uh, interesting, and hopefully it can be corrected uh, that uh, these uh, things are taking so long. So I'm, I'm hoping that given the testimony submitted by the acting administrator, given uh, the past record, uh, that we can do better in the future. And that's why we're here today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman DeFazio. I'd like to welcome uh, Acting Administrator K. J Jane Williams of Fe Federal Transit Administration and ask for her testimony at this time. 
Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Norton, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee. I would also like to recognize Chairman DeFazio and Ranking Member Graves. Thank you for inviting me here to appear before you today to talk about the Federal Transit Administration's Capital Investment Grants Program. FTA's mission is to improve public transportation for America's communities. And last year, we invested more than $15 billion to support public transportation consistent with the law. In all of our work, FTA continues to focus on implementing Secretary Chow's three major priorities, safety, innovation, and infrastructure investment. Last April, FTA certified the Washington Metro Rail Safety Commission as a safety state oversight agency. The certification allowed FTA to transfer direct safety authority to the Washington Metro Rail Area Transit Authority's Metro Rail System, to the WMSC, after nearly four years of direct safety oversight. When I began my tenure at FTA in August of 2017, there was not one single state safety oversight program certified by FTA. Now, 18 months later, well before the April 15th deadline, all 31 state safety oversight programs were certified, allowing billions of dollars of transit funding to continue to support agencies across our nation. FTA has also achieved significant success in advancing innovation in public transportation. FTA's Mobility on Demand program, which I know is a subject of interest to you, Madam Chair, has supported new forms of mobility, such as car sharing services and automation. Our MOD program has helped meet the expectations of the traveling public for modernized service through on-demand options, integrated fare payments, and ride sharing. My testimony today focuses on the Trump administration's track record in advancing CIG projects. The CIG program plays a significant role in modernizing and expanding public transportation in communities across our nation. Authorized at $2.3 billion annually, it is FTA's largest discretionary investment program. And under President Trump and Secretary Chow's leadership, FTA has advanced 25 projects with totaling approximately $7.6 billion in funding. In fact, in just the first two years of the Trump administration, FTA signed 13 CIG grant agreements, totaling $3.3 billion. And yet, in the same first two years of the previous administration, only 10 construction grant agreements were signed, totaling only a little over $1 billion in investment. In 2018 alone, FTA was able to execute 10 construction grant agreements, including one of our largest to date, $1.17 billion to Linwood Link light rail system in Seattle. The President's FY 2020 budget request also supports the CIG program with $1.5 billion in funding, including for the first time, $500 million for potential new capital investment grant projects funded through the general fund. FTA is moving projects through the CIG program in accordance with the law. It is a priority of the administration to streamline the process as much as possible, and we are making progress. Just last month, we took a major step in implementing the expedited project delivery program. However, it's important to note that CIG projects are often delayed by local challenges that impact the timing of construction grant awards. FTA does not sign construction grant agreements, committing millions and many times billions of dollars until we have assurance from the project sponsors that they have met the multiple steps outlined in law, that all non-CIG funding is committed and the project's cost, scope, and schedule are firm and final. FTA has also emphasized the need for a firm local financial commitment, recommending a balanced approach for local, state, and private sector funding through value capture, alongside federal grants and loans. Simply put, that's just good governance. Over many years, across multiple administrations, FTA has encouraged project sponsors to leverage federal dollars to capture the value we all recognize transit brings to communities across the nation. And like you, we want to ensure that projects funded with taxpayer dollars are sound investments. In closing, let me assure you that FTA will continue to process projects 
through the program consistent with the law and will review projects based on its merits. During my tenure as FTA's acting administrator, I have met with hundreds of stakeholders and members of Congress and staff. I look forward to continuing to work with this committee and each of you, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you for that uh, testimony. Um, without objection, the witness's full statement will be included in the record. Um, Acting Administrator Williams, I listened closely to your testimony. I am uh, used to Congress slowing things up. We do it all the time. It takes three branches, and even this branch, uh, as we've recently seen, takes a long time when things matter. And I, I, I noted that you seemed, in fact, you did blame all the project delays on the local level, and you didn't offer a single example of delays by the Department of Transportation. Now, the um, data shows uh, that approved times, times at your levels, have doubled. Why should we conclude that the delays are solely the, fa the fault of of transit agencies, and look, Ms. Uh, uh, Administrator Williams, <laughs> uh, I'm willing to accept for the agencies, the, uh, for, the, for the localities' faults on their side, but we're not going to get anywhere if, uh, unless everybody accepts responsibility. Now, we have figures showing <laughs> delays, and I, I, I want to know why we should, why you won't take responsibility for those delays and then indicate what you think you can do about them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, let me talk a little bit about the, the data. Um, the data compares the last two years of the Obama administration with the first two years of the Trump administration. And I would argue that the first two years of a first term administration looks very different than the last two years of a second term. All right, given that, what are you going to do about it, uh, Ms. Williams? And, I mean, and even if one accepts that notion, uh, it's the first time I've ever heard that kind of comparison made. We're really interested uh, in behalf of these a uh, local agencies in remedies. What are you going to do about them? I think our record um, speaks for itself. We were able to bring 15 construction grant agreements across the finish line in just the first two years. And when you compare that to the first two years of the previous administration, that's two more and two, billions, two billion dollars more in investment. We have 10 more allocations that have been made. In our administration, when we make an allocation, it is our signal that we are looking to bring that over the finish line as well, that project. So you think you're going to be able to, to, to equal the last administration? Uh, I mean, part of it is dictated Now that you are comparing yourself to that administration. Part of it, I will tell you, and, and you know, uh, we have talked about this across administrations, we are also only allowed to deal with what comes to us. So I am constrained, just like all administrations have been, with what is in the pipeline and what is ready. In well, the let's, let's talk about that. Uh, CIG projects seeking funding have increased the figures I've been given is 112 percent from 25 to 53 projects. So people are coming yes. in, mm -hmm. uh, fast and furious, massive demand for new transit projects. And that's across the nation. Um, now, you, you, you testified that the, um, uh, your, your testimony of is that for the FY20 bu 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 budget, the administration is seeking 1.5 billion for CIG projects, which is a 40% cut. Sadly, of course, that is better than the draconian Trump administration uh, request. Uh, if the need for CIG projects is increasing, why, why is the administration proposing cuts in the program? We believe the $1.5 billion figure is what we will need for FY 2020. We believe that's what will be ready. The $500 million will cover projects that we believe now 
will be ready uh, for funding in FY 2020. And that is an estimate because some things are borne out at the local level that are unanticipated. Um, if you look at the Durham project in North Carolina, no one anticipated that project having the third party. Well, if, 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 if some project falls out, given the demand, there would be other projects ready to step up. Uh, uh, Administrator Williams, our concern is, is that we are not even trying to meet the demand. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid your testimony doesn't help us to believe that you will be able to accelerate that demand. I'm going to ask the uh, ranking member uh, if he would offer his questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and again, Acting Administrator Williams, thanks for being here. You and I have had an opportunity to speak on numerous occasions, and uh, I believe you're doing everything in your power to ensure that the FTA executes the CIG program that's consistent with the laws that, mm -hmm. that we, we make here and sometimes may bind you with. Uh, that may be a question you might want to answer is, you know, what are we doing here, here at, uh, in this institution, this branch, uh, that makes it more difficult for you to implement programs like CIG? I think it's, you know, it's a blend of doing things fast and doing things right. You're talking about billions of dollars of federal investment and so as much as we absolutely want to streamline projects, we have to make sure that they're done correctly as well. And so it is a, a topic that I'm sure we'll work with the committee as we look at reauthorizing the FAST Act of ways that maybe we could streamline the, uh, the CIG program. I'd be happy to work with you, Congressman. Well, we appreciate that, uh, Acting Administrator. And, and you know, we, we want that. I mean, that's why you're here today. We, we want to come together and have a bipartisan uh, highway reauthorization and transit reauthorization, and, and we're going to need your help. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, my district is less urban, and we've seen ridership even in some of the most urban areas in the country. It seems to go down. You know, I, I think our goal should be how do we put policies in place here at this committee that are going to encourage more public transportation ridership, not just in those urban areas where it's even falling, mm -hmm. but in the smaller communities that I serve. And, and with that being said, you mentioned it's pretty complex to deal with a, a billion dollar, a billions of dollars in a program, and I get that, I understand that. What can I do and what can we do at this committee to help communities in smaller rural areas that I've mentioned, how can they take advantage of programs like the CIG? You and I, you visited my district before. You've seen the small rural transit districts I serve. I reached out to them. None of them have participated in this program, but they're interested. They may have opportunities in the future. How do we give them those opportunities? I think, you know, Congressman, it's an interesting question because really the CIG program, we have no rural projects. I think there has been one done in the entire history uh, out in Colorado, a bus rapid transit project. Um, it really doesn't um, allow for a rural project to enter. Even small urban projects have a difficulty really being able to compete and being able to meet all the requirements in law. And so we, I'd be happy to look at that with you more and see how we could make it more amenable to smaller rural areas in our country. Well, that'd be great. I, I'm certainly hoping that uh, with Colorado being the, the loan project that maybe Illinois 13th District a couple of years from now might be another one. Uh, but let's work together to ensure that, that we address these issues. You know, you're gonna talk about some of the issues with CIG, and you mentioned uh, in your response to Chairman DeFazio's uh, PowerPoint, you know, about you know, what this administration has done over the last two years. I, I do want to make a point uh, that you made earlier. It, it is imperative that we look at the last two years of the last administration and, and look at what we project the next two years to be. Um, you know, the goal of this committee has and, and always will be to put good policies in place without letting partisanship get in the way. And that's why I commend Chairman DeFazio and also Chair, Chair uh, Lady Norton for allowing us this opportunity to come together. Is there anything with the time that I have left that you, know, you haven't had a chance to mention in your short time uh, up there that you may wanna get across to the committee and to the, the folks that are watching today that may be helpful as to why this CIG program is so important and then also why it's important to your administration? I think clearly uh, we put $15 billion uh, into transit this year. Uh, clearly that shows our um, 
willingness to support transit and the capital investment grant program, although um, we may disagree on the amount of money in the FY 2020 budget. It is a change um, in that it is not a zero uh, there. It's 500 million. I think that speaks to the fact that we believe that's what the number is. Uh, we are constrained by what comes to us and what's ready to be funded. Uh, and we believe that that is, is the correct number. And so I'm, I'm happy to talk more with members and, and have those conversations. And we're happy to work with the committee as we've been. Well, thank you again, Administrator, and uh, just so you know, I'm thankful as a resident of Illinois for the investment CIG has made in the Chicagoland area, mm -hmm. uh, because Chicagoland Transit has a tremendous impact on downstate transit and the rest of our state, too. So yes. thank you for that investment there, too. And with that, I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Yes, I uh, had the opportunity to, to visit Chicago, and they have a great system. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate your response, uh, the response to the ranking member that you'd be willing to work with the committee and you compare the last two years of one administration with the first two years of another. So if you would, uh, if we see any improvement, I think we'd be very pleased. So if you would uh, give us on a quarterly basis uh, what, the, uh, what, what, what the number of projects that have been approved, that would be very helpful. Absolutely, we'd be happy to, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman DeFazio. Oh, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I, I've got to say, I find the uh, nonsensical to say, well, it's the first two years of this administration, and of course things are, first off, the first budget proposed killing the program altogether. And I don't think we've recovered from that. And I believe that Mr. Mulvaney and his uh, new hench person over at OMB are still hostile uh, to transit. And I assume that that pressure and that attitude uh, filters, uh, filters down. And it was a very broad bipartisan consensus of the Congress that said no, hell no, and pushed back. Uh, but now we've got other issues. Uh, one would be, uh, you know, the, uh, the changes in the, the risk assessment process that are incurring additional costs. Um, when, where did that idea originate? Actually, um, the risk assessment process from 2006 until 2016 uh, was at the probability 65 level. Uh, it was changed, uh, I'm sorry, at the, at the probability 65 level and it was changed to probability 50 uh, at that time uh, by FTA and neither time was it sent out for notice and comment. And I wanna clear up, I think there's some confusion as to what we use that for. Um, it's, a, it's an internal tool that FTA uses to measure the risk in the project. And so it is not adding cost to the project. So it's, um, you know, it's your budget and your cost. So if the budget says mm -hmm. the, the project is going to cost $100 million, and, and yet you, know, you, you cost it out at only $75 million, you need to add $25 million to the project, or you need to make the budget and the cost meet. So it's not about adding additional costs to projects or increasing those, co well, uh, those but it, costs. But it requires them to maintain a larger contingency fund, it, it regardless requires. of the merits of the project or the viability of the agency or anything else. It's, it's an arbitrary thing. And it does require them to set aside more contingency funds, correct? It requires them to predict more accurately the cost of their actual, the actual cost of their project. And we believe that that's good governance and that that's what the taxpayer deserves to know, that they have a better than 50-50 chance of the project coming in on time and on budget. And like I said, this was a tool used for many years internally by FTA and was just changed for the last two years from 16 to 18 when we reverted back, seeing project costs, bids coming in much higher than what were predicted. And we felt that it was necessary to go back to that probability 65. Okay. then. Um, have you or any member of your staff uh, ever strongly implied, and we have heard this repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly from transit agencies, they won't say that we have to come in under 40%. They just say, we have never approved a project that came in, uh, you know, that wasn't below 40%. And so, I mean, if, if now, if that's not the case, I'd like you to say it now, that you're willing to look at and approve projects 
uh, at above 40%, because you know we have just heard this so many times that that is the word in the transit community. Even though the law prohibits that, even though the law sets a much higher threshold, that the agency is saying, no, uh, this is policy, uh, you know, as set uh, informally uh, by the administration. So this is an approach used by both the Bush administration and the Obama administration, and we believe that the best chance of success for a project is when it's a blend of local, state, and private contracts. Got that, but Congress has says 51, and your agency is telling people you have to be under 40. In Will fact, you say here that, that there is no informal policy that it, you'd be totally open to looking at projects that come in over 40 percent and they would have as good a chance of, of, of approval as anything else given their merits? Yes or no? In fact, Chairman. Yes or no? Chairman, we just moved the BART project in San Francisco into engineering at a 43 percent share. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, many of our mega it's projects. It's not a new start. It's a core capacity project, but it is a large contribution but on why the does the side. Why do the agencies across the country have this impression? And why are they all coming in our, under 40 percent? Historically, most of our large projects have come in under 40 percent, but that's no different than many of the large projects in past administrations. When you're but, asking but I never heard before investment. from the transit agencies that they were being bullied to come in under 40 percent. I am not aware of anybody bullying. Okay, so you are willing to look at projects and approve projects over 40 percent. We always look at every project and we Are you willing to of look at so. and approve projects over 40 percent up to the statutory cap? Could you yes, answer the Chairman, question? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. She says yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Webster. Madam Chair. How can automated vehicles improve efficiency and cost? So automation in, um, in transit, I think where we will see it first is in maintenance cost improvements for transit agencies, uh, such as parking buses closer together in the urban centers, um, being able to automate buses through bus washes and the like. I think we're still a ways off before we see automation in actual buses itself. So what percentage do you think it is right now? Well, that's difficult to predict, sir. Um, it, it's still a fair amount of years off, I believe. Okay. I have a, a kind of a personal question. Mm -hmm. um, in, in 2014, the Silver Line began in DC Transit and they had new cars, 7,000 series. Um, I just wondered if you could do anything about the improper message that's been on there for five years. It, when the doors open to allow people on, it says doors open. When the doors close, it says stand back, doors opening. And I think it's a safety issue. Just You're the first person to come along that I've been able to say anything to about it. But, so let me understand. So when the doors are closing, it says the doors are opening? Yes. I will take care of that today, sir. I, I was not aware. In fact, I rode a 7,000 series car here on the green line, switched at LaFont, and I didn't notice that, that recording. So I don't think anybody else has either, <laughs> but wow. it's there. So it's, I, will, just, I, have a, I have a great relationship with the general manager, Paul Wiedefeld. I will give him a call this afternoon after our hearing. Awesome. Thank okay. you, sir. You'll back. I thank the member for that keen observation. Uh, Mr. Johnston of Georgia. Thank you, Madam Chair, for hosting this hearing today, and thank uh, you, uh, Madam Williams, for appearing today. Uh, it's a fact that the Trump administration has taken steps to roll back the environmental review process for federal infrastructure projects. Can you explain uh, whether or not uh, you have any concern that you, your agency may be approving projects improperly vetted for their potential environmental threat to nearby ecosystems and communities? No, sir, I don't have a, a concern about that. We, um, in the CIG program in particular... And you do admit that uh, the uh, uh, environmental 
review process has been rolled back, correct? I, I'm here to speak as the acting administrator of FTA. All I can speak to is what we do you in know. the CIG program, and I can tell you that NEPA, we follow NEPA uh, very closely, and that is done early on in the CIG process. And so uh, we take that very seriously, sir. Mm -hmm. You're not really concerned about the environmental impacts uh, that may have been improperly assessed due to the uh, cutback in the review process. In fact, in the CIG program, one of the, uh, we base our decisions on project justification and finance ratings, and in the project justification is environmental benefits, and that's one of the categories we look very, uh, you know, we look at to make sure that when we rate a project, it's, it's properly rated. So it's a definitely a, a consideration in our CIG program. Can you explain how the uh, rollbacks in the re environmental review process are compatible with the FTA's requirements for project development or the project development phase of their grant approval process? I'm not sure I understand the question, sir. We haven't rolled back any environmental review processes for CIG projects in FTA. All right, fair enough. Thank you. You're welcome, you back. Sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Administrator, for, for being here. Could we put the slides back up that, uh, that the ch uh, chairman had up uh, to begin with? I, I wanted to, to, to look at the cost share shrinking in, in particular. I, my friend, Mr. Mulvaney, was, uh, was invoked uh, there. We worked on a lot of budget cutting that's going on uh, uh, while he was on Capitol Hill. Madam Administrator, when we see the uh, cost share shrink from from the pre-17 to the post-17 levels, so that's just over over 10 percent. How much of that money is going uh, back to the taxpayer for for deficit reduction? Uh, none. None. You're, you're saying that we're reducing the amount of money we're sending to an individual project, and the taxpayer isn't benefiting from that at all. Where in the world is that money going? Well, that's actually staying in the CIG program to make sure that we have other projects that we can fund. So actually, it is allowing us to fund additional projects across the country. You're saying that, that when, the, when the chairwoman noted that applications to this project, to this fund, had more than doubled, mm -hmm. you've been able to fund more projects than you would have otherwise been able to fund uh, by reducing uh, the, the federal cost share. Right, so they've doubled in number and also in size. We have more projects coming in asking for more funding, so they're larger projects as well. Well, I'm going to have to talk to my friend, Mr. Mulvaney, about why the taxpayer isn't is it getting it. sounds like what you're doing is you're trying to, to, to take a program that has been oversubscribed and underfunded and participate with as many different uh, projects across the country uh, as you can. Is, is, am I understanding the goal correctly? Yes, you are. Well, I, I hope that you won't let uh, uh, that uh, goal uh, uh, disappear. Uh, we do have to find uh, ways, and, and coming from a community that, that uh, uh, does a lot of self-starting, uh, 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 we've uh, just passed a billion dollars uh, locally in, in new transportation uh, taxes. Uh, I don't want to see all the giant projects in the country uh, suck up all the funding stream. I don't want to see the big guys who are used to accessing a program uh, like this suck up all the funding stream. I appreciate uh, that effort uh, to try to move, uh, uh, move more money to more uh, projects. Uh, let me go back to something else the, the chairman said about uh, the, the risk assessment, because I, I do. My, my, my constituents don't mind investing uh, money in transformational projects. They mind throwing money down a rat hole uh, towards failures. When we moved uh, from a probability 65 uh, standard down to a probability 50 standard, meaning the odds of success of, of coming in uh, uh, on budget or under budget uh, diminished uh, uh, dramatically, what did we see? Did, did, it, did it not make a material difference to the success of projects across the country when the standard fell from P65 to P50? It, it absolutely did. And that actually, the reason we even considered it is it, became, it came to me from our career professional staff who said, you know, we're seeing project bids come in you know, much higher given the, the really booming economy we're having, the tightening of the labor market. We're seeing, you know, project bids come in much higher and projects like the Wave Streetcar was the very first project I approved as the acting administrator in Florida 
was not actually able to absorb that cost increase and was not able to move forward, it really caused us to take a step back and really look at all the projects. And that was one of the earlier delays. I felt that it was really important to understand what happened in that project so that we didn't have another project that, that we approved that that happened to. The, I know we fund CIG out of the general fund. I hope this committee will have a conversation about finding a permanent funding stream for mass transit. Generally, it's an it's a interest we all uh, share, and, and to have to pick up the crumbs off the, off the table is not the right way uh, to fund a, a major national infrastructure program like this. But for you to make those changes, again, returning to what uh, had a better success rate during the Obama administration and the, and the Bush administration in terms of a P65 standard, for you to try to, to squeeze uh, more projects into your limited uh, budget stream, even though it produces charts uh, like uh, this one, to give more communities an opportunity to benefit. I just want you to know how much uh, I appreciate uh, that. I think our job is, is not to tell you what a great job you're doing, it's to hold you accountable when you're not doing a great job. But on these uh, two fronts in particular, uh, I'm grateful uh, for your efforts. I know it has not uh, been easy and know, uh, know how much uh, it is valued. Um, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, sir. Oh, Ma Madam Chair, could I? Uh, if, if there is any other information on these charts that you didn't get a chance to talk about, uh, feel free to submit that uh, uh, for writing. I know charts can sometimes be misleading, and I want to make sure we have the very best information. Okay, we will do so. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your indulgence, Madam Chair. Certainly, that, that doesn't, it, there doesn't seem to be any, uh, any uh, problem it, with more, m more projects being funded. That that's really is, has not been the problem. The problem is that there are funds not being used and people or jurisdictions waiting to be funded. Uh, Ms. Malinowski, uh, Mr. Malinowski, please. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Williams, I, I wanted to um, ask you about a specific project that is existentially important to my state and, frankly, the economy of the Northeast, the, the Portal North mm -hmm. Bridge uh, project. Um, for those who don't know, this is a 110-year-old railroad bridge. It's a swing bridge that, that swings open when boats pass, and when it swings back, it is so rickety that sometimes a guy needs to go out there with a sledgehammer to lock it back into place. Everybody, this is not a partisan issue in my part of the country. Everyone understands it needs to be uh, replaced. Um, we have, Congress has provided the funding to get this project, to fund the federal part of the project, and yet you have given it a medium low rating because you've decided that local funds were not committed. Uh, would you briefly define for us what you consider to be committed funding from the local partner? Absolutely, sir. Uh, committed means nothing else has to occur to have access to that funding. And so in New Jersey, I think there has been somewhat of a, uh, a miscommunication in that uh, many people feel that we are saying they have to sell the bonds. That is not what we're asking. Uh, what we're asking is that the funds need to be committed, which means New Jersey Transit has to have access to those funds today. Today, they do not. And, and in fact, they brought this to our attention through the CIG process, that there were requirements in New Jersey state law that they needed to meet in order to have access to those funds. And they are making progress. I believe there was uh, a New York uh, DOT sign-off that they had to uh, receive by the end of June which I understand they've re re received. Um, New Jersey Transit has to have it approved by their board, and this is to be uh, funded in their state transportation plan. And so once they have that done, I believe it comes to FTA and FHWA, our federal highway. Um, and once they have those steps completed, then that way I believe they will be considered committed. And then they can resubmit an application for an additional rating, which I'm sure they will do in the fall. Okay, well, that's, that's helpful. I just want to hone in on this precisely. Um, I mean, as you know, the, the state of New Jersey has agreed to fund up to $600 million of this project through a bond issue that will be securely backed by our gas tax. There's another $200 million that has been committed. So you're not saying the bond has to actually have been issued? No, I'm not. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so this definition of having access to funds, because there are a number of other projects as I think you know, around the country that have received the medium rating where bonds have not been issued. Right. Um, the Durham Light Rail Project, the Phoenix South Central 
light rail extension, which is supposed to be backed by a sales tax that has to be approved by the voters and the referendum hasn't been held. Why is that receiving a medium rating given how secure the, the commitment in New Jersey is? And here you have a project that, that needs to be approved by the voters and has not yet been. What I can tell you is that everybody has to comply with the same requirements. So my technical team, which are career times, have looked at each mean that they have to sell the bonds. So in individual cases, I'm happy to get that uh, back to you for the record. But my understanding is that they were able to meet the requirement to have access to the funding in the project. And so it must be something that's in, in, inconsequential to the state income tax that hasn't been passed. Okay, that's helpful, and we would, be, we would appreciate following Absolutely. up with you on happy to do that the differences too. and similarities, because we need to understand there is a common standard. Mm -hmm. um, let, let me ask you about a, a, another project, which I'm sure you have heard about, uh, and, and that is the Hudson River Tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, right now, the, one of the major holdups uh, there uh, is a lack of a record of decision for um, the environmental impact statement. Um, that statement was completed and submitted to you in, frankly, a record period of time, 14 months, given to the department in June of 2017, with an estimated completion of March 30th, 2018. This was what the department uh, told us. It's been more than 15 months since that original completion, predicted completion date. Um, FRA Administrator Batori testified before us last year that the EIS would be completed in the first or second quarter this year. This hasn't happened. Madam Williams, where is the environmental impact statement and why has it taken so long? Well, what I can tell you is the Federal Railroad Administration is the lead uh, on the EIS for the Hudson Tunnels. Uh, we are a cooperating agency, and we are working diligently to complete that. I know Mr. Pretori was up on the Hill just a few weeks ago um, and stated that there were still some steps that needed to be completed. It is a very complex project, um, and so it is taking a bit longer to, to get finished. And so I would say to you that that's really in um, FRA's court, and we're working very closely with them to get that done. Thank you very much. The time has expired. Mr. Katko. Kat Katko. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here today, Ms. Williams. Uh, before I ask a couple of questions about cybersecurity, amongst others, I do want to make an observation. We are members of Congress. We control the powers of the purse, and we control uh, what legislation goes to any president. So to the extent that there's been observations here that uh, somehow the administration may be an impediment to getting something done, I would only challenge both sides to think in a bipartisan manner. If we produce a good enough highway bill and it's bipartisan, it will be veto-proof and we can get what we want. We will not get it by partisanship. We will get it by working together, all of us of all stripes, to get this done. And there's not a, anything in this country that I can see needs more addressing than infrastructure. And if we don't work together, it, it, we were going to continue to uh, be in the malaise we're in now. So I encourage all of us to put down our swords and work together to get infrastructure done once and for all, on, on the highway side at least. Now, with respect to cyber, I'm ranking member on the Homeland Security Cyber Subcommittee and have been briefed many times about the threat of the Chinese influence in our transportation systems and our cybersecurity systems nationwide. Um, Congresswoman Rice, my friend from New York area, and, uh, and I wrote a letter to New York City subway uh, authorities about their plan to purchase Chinese-made subway systems. It's a very big concern, and I think we've established in other hearings before this committee and others the influence of, the, of, of Chinese uh, in this area and their desire to infect the products that they put into the United States and like 5G technology, as well as uh, train technology, uh, with spyware, for example, uh, embedded into the systems. So uh, we, in that letter to New York City, we were trying to note the fact that, first of all, Chinese are trying to do that, and second of all, they're undercutting the markets and putting a lot of other train manufacturers out of business, therefore, uh, by default, being the only train supplier around. Um, it's a huge problem, and it's something that cannot be ignored, and I know the Washington Metropolitan System is weighing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know what your office is doing in that regard and whether or not 
providing money for funding of like a subway system in, in San Francisco and there are additional trains there. What are you doing to make sure that we don't have this, these Chinese products coming into the system and therefore creating a greater vulnerability? Because if you think about it, even if they provide Wi-Fi, everything that people are using on the Wi-Fi system is, is getting back to them. And uh, the evasion of privacy and the national security implications are, are, are pretty serious. So with that, I'd just like to have you talk about that. We, of course, support uh, your concern when it comes to cybersecurity and the rail car manufacturing. Um, unfortunately, we have no direct role uh, at FTA to require transit agencies to buy a certain product from a certain manufacturer. Uh, we do make sure if they use federal funding, they have to be Buy America compliant. Um, but unfortunately, there's no way for us to preclude them from purchasing rail cars from any manufacturer they want if they are considered by America compliant at this time. So even, even if they present a potential threat that's been established in Congress, has been established in the national security agencies, that's the case? I know that there's uh, language on the Hill now to prevent that from occurring, and we would certainly be very supportive of that. And what are you referring to? Uh, I believe it was something that the, ch the Madam Chair put into the defense bill, the defense appropriations bill that would, would preclude those purchases. So what, what would you need, is it that type of language or is there other language that you, would, that you think would be helpful as well? We can certainly work with the committee if you think there's additional language. Uh, maybe there's something to look at lo more longer term um, in a reauthorization bill, but certainly uh, shorter term appropriation bills would be appropriate. We're happy to work with you. Madam Chair, I'm happy to work with you on that as well. I think it's a very important issue and that we need to be mindful of it. Um, also, uh, uh, you talk about ways uh, we could possibly streamline the FAST Act and improve what we've been doing. And if we really are gonna work together to get this done, I would very much appreciate any input and frank input you could have on uh, what the next generation of a highway bill would look like. And if you have any general suggestions right now, we'd like to hear them. Well, we'd be happy to work with you on that. Today I'm really prepared to talk about the Capital Investment Grant Program, but we're certainly happy to work with the committee um, on reauthorization proposals as we get closer the reauthorization. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, um, uh, Madam Chair. By the way, thank you for putting that, your suggestion into the National Defense uh, Authorization uh, Bill as it relates to what the gentleman was just uh, speaking about. Acting Administrator Williams, I want to thank the FTA for his recent commitment of $100 million for the South Central Light Rail extension in uh, the city that I used to lead as mayor of Phoenix, Arizona. This federal investment is critical to the future of light rail in South Phoenix. It's a project that we have long fought for, and when completed, it will connect the uh, community to new economic opportunities, jobs, education, health care, social services, and more. That project uh, has been ranked as one of the top projects in the United States of America in terms of using public infrastructure to help lift people uh, out of poverty. Over the past year, the local transit agency in Maricopa County, Valley Metro, has been working with the FTA to advance a number of critical transit projects, Tempe Streetcar, Northwest Extension Phase Two, and of course, South Central that I just mentioned. The Tempe Streetcar in particular is at a critical stage and the pending grant agreement must be approved soon. Mm -hmm. The deadline for this to be finalized by the FTA is September 1st, prior to the shutdown of the transit award management system which could occur anywhere from September 20th through October 11th. My understanding is the grant needs to be sent to the Hill for circulation by September 6th at the very latest, while Valley Metro can complete construction of this project under the current letter of prejudice, letter of no prejudice, excuse me, and while they may be able to enter in a grant agreement as late as December 15th, Valley Metro will experience serious cash flow issues as soon as September. I understand that all required documentation for approval has been submitted by Valley Metro. Can you provide me with assurances that this project will receive the necessary approvals in time to meet these deadlines? Absolutely, sir. We have a great working relationship with Scott Smith, the GM there. Um, he has done a terrific job of bringing that project across the finish line. There's been some hiccups with Tempe Streetcar, and he's managed that very well. As you know, you noted in your uh, earlier remarks that we just did a $100 million allocation to a second project in our program, the South Central Light Rail Project, and we have a great working relationship, and you have my commitment to get that done for him. That's great. Uh, Phoenix does have a dedicated funding source. When I was mayor, we did that dedicated funding source. The people of Phoenix overwhelmingly supported 
a transportation infrastructure investment in our local community, 35 years, $32 billion, and the uh, first uh, program under that uh, election uh, and that source of revenue was the South Central line. Mm -hmm. um, as some of the witnesses on the second panel have noted in their written testimony, there have been concerns about revised federal cost share for CIG projects. It's my understanding that you've been working with Valley Metro to resolve those concerns over a proposed federal share for several projects in our region. And I appreciate your continued effort on this front, and I want to uh, add my support to maintaining the level of federal participation that was anticipated when these projects were initially planned. Of course, we don't want to move the goalposts in the middle of the game. Mm -hmm. Can you provide your thoughts on how FTA will resolve the cost sharing issues in keeping with those expectations of the local sponsors of these projects? Yeah, I think as I mentioned earlier, you know, being able to look at value capture, I think uh, the industry as a whole um, tends to think of that as only tax uh, increment financing, and we want to broaden that uh, definition to include uh, things like uh, land deals, operation and maintenance uh, costs, naming rights. Um, there, we all recognize that transit brings value to our nation's communities, but sometimes we don't capture that value for transit. Uh, we sit at USDOT at the Navy Yard, that looks a whole lot different than it did 30 some years ago when I was first in DC. And a lot of that is due to the green line coming in, that metro line coming into that area. And yet none of that revenue was really, and that, that increase in value was really borne out to the transit agency. And so our uh, commitment is to help the transit agency really capture that value that they bring to a community because we know communities value transit and we want to make sure that they capture that value and, and invite those private investors to the table so that we can have additional funding to, to be able to fund more projects across the entire country. We need to do more to make the case for transit, not just as a way to move people to jobs and education and health care, but as an economic development tool in my city, in my community, our initial 20 plus mile line of the light rail did result in $11 billion in public and private uh, investment. I would argue that public transportation investment is as strong of an economic development tool as almost anything else that we can do at the local level and in partnership with the, uh, with the federal government. I yield back, thank you. I would agree. Hey, amen, Mr. St Mr. Stanton. Uh, Mr. Uh, Babin. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, appreciate it, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, uh, Administrator Williams, for being here. Uh, you have a very important job, uh, so thank you for being here with us today to discuss the capital investment uh, grant program. On one hand, you have a certain group of people concerned that the FTA is unable to, or it's even been suggested, unwilling to approve grant applications in an appropriate manner or time frame, uh, given the number of factors under your administrative authority. Then on the other hand, uh, we know that there are dozens of bureaucratic hoops that you have to jump through in order to approve a uh, a grant application, which is slowing this already arduous process down. So how can we help you along in this process, and how can this committee untie your hands in order to lessen the onerous regulations and expedite uh, a SICIG uh, grant uh, approval process in a timely manner? No, I think that the, the CIG program has evolved over many years. Um, I'm proud of the progress that we've made under the Trump administration and Secretary Chow's leadership to advance 25 projects uh, through the program. Uh, that totals $7.6 billion in funding. Um, I know some have talked about the concern of geographic diversity. Of the 15 that we've signed construction grant agreements with, six of them have been in just two states. So let me assure you, though, to that geographic diversity is a consideration, but it's certainly not a barrier. Um, you know, I think we are making progress. I know that, you know, when the administration did not request additional funding early on in the first two budgets, um, it was alluded to that there was, uh, projects were canceled. Let me assure you there was not one project canceled in the CIG program. Uh, we actually funded three projects in 2017 10 in 2018, and we funded two in 2019. So I want to make sure that there's no impression of when we, we actually requested zero funding for the CIG program in the first two years of the administration that no projects, no new projects were done. That's simply not the case. 
Um, and so we are making progress, and we would love to talk to you more as we get closer on the reauthorization uh, topic on how we could maybe streamline the CIG process a little further. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you, Congressman. And then a uh, follow-up here. There's been a good deal of conversation surrounding your dear colleague mm -hmm. a letter from last year regarding the FTA's uh, advancement of projects through the CIG program. Do you believe that any of the policies in that letter actually violate federal law? I do not. In fact, many of those policies are long-held policies through across multiple uh, administrations. Both the Bush administration and Obama administration held those policies as internal decision-making tools. Okay, and then any claims to the contrary of that seem to be incorrect, in my opinion, because I, I can't see that. But get, give me, a, the, what is the reason for, what was your reason behind sending the Dear Colleague letter in the first place? Actually, it was our attempt to be transparent as we were making discretionary uh, decisions about grants. And so it was our way of communicating that to the industry of what we were looking for. And um, unfortunately, you know, we felt it was just a, a recharacterization of what was used for a long time and it would not be surprising to anyone. Uh, we saw differently that that was not the impact we had, you know, really expected. Thank you, Administrator, and I yield thank back, you. Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much, and I want to uh, reinforce Mr. Babin's notion that this committee stands ready to help. While we, are, uh, while I have been critical of you, anything the committee can do to hasten these projects with this huge backlog, desiring funding, uh, please let us know. And thank you for that suggestion, Mr. Babin. Uh, Mr. Uh, Alred. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to uh, welcome you, Administrator Williams, mm -hmm. over here. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I, last month, I was very pleased to hear of your agency's announcement of a $60 million grant agreement with the Dallas Area Rapid Transit, uh, or DART, uh, which serves my district in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, the grant will help a project to lengthen platforms at 28 stations along the existing red and blue light rail lines, many of which are in my district. Uh, I'd also like to thank you for your recent visit to North Texas, um, which I'm sure highlighted how important transit is for our region. We are one of the most rapidly growing places in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and our economic growth and population growth is dependent on federal investment as well. And so thank you for, for that commitment and for coming to North Texas. Um, I do want to uh, mention another project that DART has applied for CIG funding. It's the second rail alignment in downtown Dallas uh, called the D2 subway. Um, this is a project that will greatly improve mobility and add capacity uh, for our system. Right now, if anything happens in downtown to block our existing line, the entire line is shut down. So this, adding a second station will be very important for us. Uh, and to kind of couple on to what some of my colleagues have said, uh, I am concerned, of course, about uh, some of the delays we've seen, but I, I trust that uh, your agencies can be working with DART to make sure that it's a full consideration. I think it's something that's certainly worthy uh, of being considered. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I want to turn to TIFIA uh, loans because um, this is an important thing for Texas. As you know, we can com combine different funding mechanisms for a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, in your dear colleague letter, you said that TIFIA will be considered, uh, quote, in the, top, in the context of federal funding sources, end quote, and, quote, not separate from the federal funding sources. Uh, can you explain how FTA is applying that standard? Okay, so let me begin by saying that uh, loans are treated by the Build America Bureau. Uh, so if RIF and TIFIA loans are, are actually handled through them. Uh, we have done multiple uh, projects that have included TIFIA loans, including Seattle being probably the most recent one. Uh, and one of the largest actual CIG projects we've done at $1.17 billion for, for Seattle. Um, what I think the dear colleague was trying to get at is that it looks at, so in CIG, we only look at the, the funding based on CIG or non-CIG funding. The repayment sources really don't factor in. Um, to that, it is a, but it is a discretionary grant program, so when the department looks at funding, they look at the total, totality of the federal investment, and so they look at everything that, that is being asked for from the federal government, and I think that's what it was getting at. Um, and so I know that has been somewhat confusing, but let me assure you that we've used TIFIA 
Uh, Maryland Purple Line is another example of where we've used a, a TIFIA loan. Well, that's, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that, mm -hmm. um, because as you know, this is not being repaid uh, with federal funds. Uh, and so mm -hmm. my concern is if we're providing less flexibility to transit projects than we are to highway projects, which mm -hmm. I think are treated differently. Is that the case? I'm, I'm not as familiar with the highway side. I couldn't okay, really okay. Uh, answer that. I'd be happy to get back to you for the, on the record for that. Sure, like. sure. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, transit's very important for us. I want to make sure that as many funding sources are available as possible. I want to work with uh, your agency and with the administration to try and do everything we can to help our area continue to grow. And for us, TIFIA and other funding sources are very important. Uh, so we'll certainly be following up with you with, about that. But I also, as I said, want to thank you for coming to North Texas and for the, the grant that DART received. It's a great program. DART is making a great advancements. We have very good leadership there, as I'm sure yes. you've seen. Yes, we have a great working relationship with Gary there. He's very forward thinking in the industry, so you're very lucky to have him there. Yeah. Thank you so much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. LaMalta. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for today's hearing. Um, let me uh, launch into this a little bit here. The, uh, now, now some, some colleagues have been saying that the administration has not been very supportive of the Capital Improvement Grant Program, CIG, uh, but through its first two years in office, the administration has approved 30% more projects and 300% of that funding uh, more funding than the previous administration had done at the same time. Uh, about 10 projects at 1 billion versus 13 projects at 3.3 billion. So uh, I don't know, I don't know where that stat comes from or doesn't seem really fair. But uh, as a Californian, I, I didn't, I have noted that uh, one thing the previous administration did do was put out money to a disastrous project like the California High Speed Rail, which uh, it's going to be at least triple the price of what was originally sold to voters in 2008 when they approved about a $10 billion bond. And then following that, $3.5 billion of stimulus money to stimulate the economy back in 2009 came forth from the federal government. One billion of that, almost one billion has not been spent, and I appreciate the administration trying to claw that back. We're working on legislation known as H.R. 1515 to claw back the rest of the two and a half billion since it has not performed, it's a breach of contract, that it's not even gonna be a high-speed rail system from SF to LA. It's gonna st start in Merced and end in, a, end in an almond orchard somewhere around Bakersfield. That's not high-speed rail, that's not SF or LA, I think, by their standards. So that dollar needs to come, those dollars need to come back and go into true transit projects that can help everybody. That's what we'll seek to do if they don't meet their marks, which I think they have not already met. So. Uh, what we bring up today is this capital investment for rural communities, and my colleague, Mr. Davis, mentioned that as well. Um, it's mostly for grants to passenger rail, light rail, or buses. So uh, that means all taxpayers are paying for programs that only benefits, mostly only benefits cities and suburbs without any practical rural application. So we had a roundtable about this last month. It was about mobility on demand, and some of the things being talked about or some kind of public-private transit system to help the rural elderly get to their doctor's appointments, et cetera, to help the rural disabled to get to their jobs, or even help rural veterans to get their VA facilities, at least until we have the community care kicks in more effectively to give veterans more, more choices more locally. Um, so we have these things, you know, we can be delivering groceries or prescriptions uh, instead of them having to get in their car and go. Uh, we had one hospital brought up that uh, they could increase their success of, uh, of uh, appointments not being met by being able to in integrate this into it. So we, we need a more uh, rural component on that, I think, in order to have some kind of fairness. So do you think the FTA would be willing to work with Congress to adapt the CIG program for these mobility on demand projects I'm speaking of? So, uh, and what kind of applications can you see for that, uh, uh, Administrator Williams? And thank you for being here. Absolutely. We would love to work with this committee and Congress on how CIG could apply to the rural side of the country. I'd have to tell you that you're correct in that many of these projects uh, lie in the very large urban centers of the country where mass transit is, is uh, most viable. Um, for instance, in New York alone, there are five projects, two of which are in the gateway suite of nine projects uh, that total $10 billion in investment. 
And so if you look at if we were to fund all of those projects, including the two we spoke of, the Portal North Bridge and Hudson Tunnels, we are talking about the entire appropriation, FAST Act appropriation for this program. All of it would be consumed by what projects would be requested from just New York alone. And so sure. there, when you look at a nationwide program, you, you need to be cognizant of that. And so we would be happy to work with the committee and, and look at how we can help rural America as well on the mobility on demand side. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go back to a, so a couple stats that were thrown out at the beginning of the hearing here on CIG projects and the letter of no prejudice mm -hmm. uh, time frame. It was stated that, uh, again, since 2017, this administration has taken about 78 days to get through the LONP, whereas the credit was given to the pre previous administration of it being 54 days. Well, was that a cherry-picked number, the 54 days? Was that in the first two years of that previous administration when they didn't have uh, <laughs> their staff hired out or con confirmation of uh, key people in the department and all that. So what, what, was, the, what was the length of, of uh, number of days it took for the two, first two years of the previous administration to get the letter out versus um, the number of days right. that I, you've heard here? I, I would argue, Congressman, that the first two years of a brand new administration is very different when you compare it to the last two years of a second term presidency. Um, you know, when you look at a letter of no prejudice, uh, we are very cognizant that although that letter says we are not committing federal resources to this project, many grant sponsors do just that. They, they communicate that to their locality, that we have the federal, you know, investment now on, on the line, that we will get federal dollars because we are allowing them to proceed on their own without any commitment from us they still message that at the local level as our commitment. And so we're very careful when we sign those letters of no prejudice that we look at the project to make sure that it is a good project on its merits and that we believe it will be able to meet the uh, scrutiny of the CIG program before we sign that. So we, you know, it's important to do things fast and streamline things, but it's also important to balance those with doing things right. Yeah, yeah, certainly it is more difficult with change of administration Mm -hmm. especially when there's change of party involved, too, in the administrations. Mm -hmm. I know things look different around here right now, too. So I yield back, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I thank you as well. I want to uh, assure the gentleman that we will work with him on rural projects. The CIG project is confined to high-density areas. Mr. Davis, the ranking member, of course, is interested in rural projects as well, so we'd be pleased to work with him. On this matter of the data, uh, I asked the staff to look at that, and I'm in, informed that the data captured all pro projects in the pipeline during the FAST Act. And that includes projects begun long before the last two years of the prior administration. <laughs> So I'm not sure how we can uh, assign these projects to one administration or another. We're talking about projects that overlap by their very na nature. Mr. Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to um, thank the um, acting administrator for being here today. And um, uh, how long have you been um, in that position of acting administrator? Since August of 2017. And um, uh, is there a reason why you're still acting? Uh, the nominee has not been confirmed at this point. Seems like a pattern in this administration. Um, and based on your testimony here, ma'am, uh, you seem very qualified for the position. So I'm just wondering why this administration can never go the entire distance uh, in confirming people. But uh, I guess it's, a, it's an ideology. Oh, uh, let me be clear. My name is not before the Senate for confirmation. Um, I'd nominate you. <laughs> let, me, let me just say, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I won't go. Senator Jerry, Mr. Malnowski um, raised the issue that I had raised. We were all very concerned about the gateway.
Frida Projects. And um, during your testimony, um, you know, I um, had my staff check uh, to, to follow up on some of the points that you made. And um, thanks to um, technology, I have a response already from back from the state of New Jersey on Wonderful. the comments you made. And uh, it's basically that the ball is actually in your court and the board approved $600 million last year um, for the NJ Transit project that we're discussing. And the state approved the budget in June. Um, so the FTA has been sent a draft uh, that you can basically approve in October. So hopefully you can take a look at that. Uh, maybe you didn't have that information up to before June, but the budget has passed, the money is there. There's no other, there's no other threshold that the state of New Jersey has to meet other than you um, acting on it. So. Our understanding is that New Jersey Transit still needs to have their board sign off on it before it comes back to FTA. So maybe that's transpired since that I've last talked to my technical team, uh, but we'd be happy to take a look at it for sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, last month um, there were media reports indicated that the sec Secretary Chow influenced the award of a Department of Transportation grant to projects in Kentucky. Uh, the reports indicated that she went so far as to designate a, um, one of her aides as a liaison between the department and Senator McConnell's office. Uh, does, the does the FTA employ similar practices in implementing the CIG program? And how can the public be certain that money meant for infrastructure investments is not swayed by political whims or relationships? No, sir. Um, I'm happy to tell you that um, there is not one CIG project in Kentucky um, that that is not something that uh, the department does under Secretary Chow's leadership. Okay. But on <clears throat> But under that same secretary, these, these um, other projects have been um, approved in Kentucky. How convenient. Many that projects is. were not, though, sir. So I'm not familiar with that. I'm really here to talk about, as the acting administrator, the CIG program. Mm -hmm. um, I can assure you that every grant program is dealt with by the career personnel in the department. Um, just like they've been across multiple administrations. So they're highly professional, very committed personnel within our department. Okay, well, I, well I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I had something else to say, but I better not. Thank you. I yield back. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Payne. Uh, Mr. Pence. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking Member. As the crossroads of America, it's critical to have reliable freight and public transportation options in Indiana. We must prioritize investments in our infrastructure mm -hmm. system, and the FTA's Capital Investment Grant Program is a crucial way states, like Indiana, work with the federal government to promote economic growth and improve rail safety. These projects help our communities thrive by attracting business to the project corridor, connecting workers to their employees, and relieving freight congestion choke points. Nearly 73% of the funds from CIG program flow directly to the private sector via manufacturers and suppliers and are located in nearly every congressional district. Administrator Williams, as you are aware, there are two projects in my home state of Indiana currently advancing through the program. When Secretary Chow visited Northwest Indiana, she saw firsthand how the Westlake Corridor and double track projects serve as a key economic driver for the Hoosier State. Currently, both projects are awaiting movement from the project development phase into the engineering phase. And I know that your office is working hard on these requests and we thank you. My good friend and fellow Hoosier, Congressman Vyslowski has been working for several years on the improvement and expansion of the South Shore Rail Line, another great example of how CIG is keeping our economy moving. 
Administrator Williams, I thank you for keeping me informed as this project moves forward. I recognize the value, valuable partnership between our state and the Department of Transportation, and I have the utmost faith in your leadership. Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pence. Uh, Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you, Madam Chair. And also, thank you, Administrator uh, Williams, for coming to our committee. I want to discuss with you something that we've already talk, been talking about and I think is critical to all of our communities, and that's that partnership between the federal government, uh, our local transit agencies, um, you know, that, that really is designed to improve and expand public transportation across the country. You know, a personal example, uh, when Secretary Chow last appeared before us in March of last year, I asked the, the uh, Secretary about the Orange County Streetcar, which is a transit project that's going to connect, as you know, Garden Grove, which is my dis congressional district, with Santa Ana, which is the county seat. The point I'm making is I emphasize that our local agency was counting on a full funding grant agreement from FDA because the, our local agency had now bids out that were set to expire and that costs would now begin, would, once that happened, would rise. What was nice was that, yes, FDA, F FTA did sign the agreement in November of last year of 2018, which had been in the New Starts program since 2015. Uh, so my question is, are other communities experiencing the same delays in the New Starts process that have seen their costs increase as a result of delays? Okay. And is FTA tracking those cost increases? So I was happy to go out to Orange County yes. and sign that FFGA with Daryl. Uh, it was uh, a significant tool, I think, for the local economy there. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would tell you is that um, I'm not sure that it included project cost increases. So when we went through the risk assessment process, um, if the risk assessment says the actual project cost is higher than what the agency is predicting it to be, we require them to meet that cost. And I think that was the issue with Orange County. I'm just, um, right, I, mm -hmm. I understand that. Um, but I'm just wondering, in other counties, are you tracking data can, that we, you could provide us about those um, uh, co that cost increase that were due to whatever, not blaming it, but this process taking longer than people expected? I'm not sure that we are tracking that specifically. I'd has, have to ask my technical team. We'd be happy to get back to you. I would appreciate on that. that. And uh, maybe you can explain to me. I may have missed some of this. Uh, when there are delays, and what are you doing, and how's the agency uh, uh, streamlining the new starts process to in, to avoid these kinds of cost increases? So let me assure you that there is not one FFGA or SSGA or LONP on my desk, my leadership's desk, or OMB's desk. So there are no delays happening. There are no delays. There, are not, there is not one single project waiting for my action as I sit here today. And so many of the actions that cause delays, sometimes there's third party agreements that are difficult to work out. Uh, there is local financial commitments that need to be made. Uh, a lot of sponsors, we worked a lot with Indiana um, on how you define committed in our program means you have access, immediate access to those funds. And many sponsors confuse that with if they have a board action saying they're going to give the funding, if that board action is required to be approved by anyone else, it's not considered actual committed funding. And so we try to make sure, we work very closely with the sponsors. Uh, my technical team is the, one of the best in government. Uh, they work with our grantees all the time to make sure they really understand what needs to happen. I appreciate that, and I, and I think it's very important what you're saying so that the applicants do understand. But I'm also talking about another issue. What about when that's all taken care of? The applicants have done what they have to do, they've applied, you know, uh, and they have bids out, they're expecting to have that. 
full, the uh, uh, full funding um, a grant agreement, and it takes longer, and then I'm, now it's going to cost, the, not because they've done anything wrong, the applicant more money. I think we obviously never want to cost uh, a project sponsor additional costs in their project, and so we work really hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Well, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I yield back. You're welcome. Thank you, Congressman. Well, I, I appreciate the, the gentleman's questions because obviously the local jurisdictions can't know what, when, when there's several of them working to get, have to work together. Uh, uh, it, it, the leadership has to come from the agency, so um, anything we can do to facilitate that, but you have the expertise. They're simply applying. And the number, if a number of them have to get together, they still are going to have to look to you for leadership on what to do and how to do it quicker. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for being here today. I think we all know that America's transportation system plays a significant role in our economic development, globalization, right and industrial development. We need to continue together, work together, on improving our public transportation innovation, especially in our rural areas, which you've heard from several people. I want to thank you for your work on FTA, and I'm particularly interested in how we can modernize public transportation and extend service into our rural communities across the nation. Can you elaborate on the department's goals and priorities to advance innovation in transportation? Yes, so we are doing a lot in our mod uh, sandbox, we call it, our mobility on demand. Um, and we're looking at different things uh, with paratransit services, which are critical in rural America. We're looking at, um, you know, younger generation expects things much quicker than many of us are used to in the public transportation field. And so developing applications where they can look online and be able to integrate their fare payments. Uh, Gary in Dallas is doing a lot of work on that. Uh, we, so we're, we're doing a lot of innovative uh, things in transit. Microtransit is, is big right now. Right-sizing the, uh, the transit system to what the ridership is is very important. Rural America has already sort of done that. Small urban and larger urban are, are coming to that. We're doing partnerships with uh, Uber and Lyft for first mile, last mile. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting innovations happening in public transportation. Well, along those lines, can you discuss the new technologies that are included in the Integrated Mobility Innovation Discretionary Grant Program? Yes, so it's a $15 million grant program that is out right now. Uh, the Notice of Funding Opportunity is out now for people to apply. It'll include fair integration uh, payments. Most people want to be able to go to their phone, hit an app, and be able to pay for their entire ride whether it be starting with Uber and Lyft to the rail system, getting off at the rail system and having a, a bike or a scooter there to take them for the last two miles. They want to do it all at one time. They want to pay for it all at once. And they want to know what that cost will be and how long it will take. And so many of the mod sandbox that we're doing will do that. So it also will, will look for ideas in automation. I talked to it earlier about uh, in the automation field, we're looking at being able to automate parking buses in the urban core closer together, more efficiently, so that you use less land space. Um, being able to automate taking them through car washes, I think you'll see that fairly soon. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of interesting things going on, but that, that notice of funding opportunity is right now out for uh, applications, and we're very excited about it. That sounds good. I, I think about in my particular rural area where people are more elderly, um, mm -hmm. the visualization of the scooters might be an interesting thing. <laughs> the CIG program is one of the government's most complex and rigorous grant programs. I understand that the number of projects seeking funding have increased. Mm -hmm. How are you and your department working to streamline the grant application process to ensure that the needed funding is delivered efficiently and cost effectively? It is difficult, I'll be honest, to streamline this program because there are so many requirements in law for these projects to meet. It is quite rigorous, um, and so it is difficult to do things. You know, you're talking about billions of dollars of federal investment, so you need to balance streamlining and doing things fast with doing things right. And so we're, we're trying to strike that balance to make sure that we, we do that and protect the federal investment as the stewards of taxpayer dollars. 
Okay, thank you. I yield back my time. Welcome. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. Mr. Espelot. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Acting Administrator Williams, for being here today. I am particularly happy that our subcommittee uh, is discussing the Capital Improvement Grants program today. This program made the MTA's Second Avenue Subway Phase One a reality, and carries nearly 200,000 people, which carries ne nearly 200,000 people each day from more than some cities and entire systems across the United States. By now, everyone knows I'm, I'm passionate. I'm a passionate advocate for the MTA Second Avenue Subway Phase Two extension project, which will finally bring subway services to a transit desert in East Harlem, in my district. The project will also connect the subway to the Metro North commuter rail system uh, to counties outside of New York City and the express bus uh, to LaGuardia Airport from 125th Street. Federal investment in New York subway is a, is a good value, so I was glad to bring uh, Chairman DeFazio to see the project, both the current completed phase and the existing tunnels that will make a large portion of the second phase. The MTA, in an effort to reduce project costs and make strategic design choices, recently changed the project to take advantage of existing tunnels on the Second Avenue in this portion of my district. These tunnels were constructed back in, 19, in the 1970s, so a lot of the work has already been done. There was federal funding available back then. The city got into fiscal trouble, and the project was left sort of like halfway through. However, I am concerned that by new FTA policies that could make it harder for this and similar projects to get off the ground, not only in New York City, but around the country. The Federal Transit Administration Last June, informed local uh, transportation agencies via a letter that they will, not, they will now need to meet a threshold of 65% certainty in the cost estimates rather than the previous 50% uh, certainty. While we all want uh, to help projects have better and more accurate cost estimates, what this change functionally means is that the agencies will likely have to increase the amount of funds they hold in contingency. So this new uh, formula will sort of like alter the, fiscals, uh, the fiscal aspects of these major uh, and important uh, transportation projects in my district. We need to be careful about placing a burden on bigger investments. A bump of 15% on estimates for large projects takes a project that has great value for the volume of riders it serves and muddies it up with an, art an artificially high price that will cost stricter, uh, a, a, a shock, uh, an unprecedented shock. And for projects whose projected costs have already been publicized, this minor policy change could result in a major roadblock if the new estimate creates negative attention, especially if much of that money may not actually be used. In the case of the Second Avenue subway, uh, the second phase extension, the current estimate cost is between $5.7 billion to $6 billion. But with this change, from P50 to P65, the project could appear to cost as much as $7.5 billion on paper. I am afraid that this artificial move will make it harder for CIG projects to get off the ground and may harm the viability of projects already in the pipeline while doing nothing to promote accurate cost estimates. My question is, uh, does the FTA still plan to hold projects to this 65% threshold? So let me unpack that a little bit. Um, phase one had a difficult opening, um, but has had great ridership. And um, I actually met with Representative Maloney, uh, Carolyn Maloney, uh, several months ago on the phase two project. Um, and it is under review in our program uh, for rating. It's never been rated. So this is a, uh, the beginning stages for this project in our process. Um, let me tell you that P65, that probability value of 65, does not increase the cost of the project. What it's trying to do is give us a 65% chance of the project cost being correct and allowing that project to come in on budget and on time. And so the concern is that, you know, MTA has a project that's underway now. It's Eastside Access. 
It's 10 years behind schedule and $5 billion over budget. And they would be the same sponsor for this second phase yeah, the, project. The MTA seems to feel that it does impact uh, uh, this bump of 15%. And uh, just to finalize, because I'm running out of time, since the second phase is in my district, I would, mm -hmm. I would look forward to speaking to you about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I'd be happy to talk to you further. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Esplod. Uh, Mr. Westerman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Administrator Williams, for your testimony and for being here today. Uh, if you look at my rural district in Arkansas, the poor congressional district, there are zero projects going on. And so you may think, what, what do I care about CIG and the projects that are out there? But actually, it affects my district because there's only a limited number of transportation dollars to go around. So I want to make sure that uh, where these projects are going on, that they're done very efficiently and in, mo in the most economical way possible. And I know that part of that is innovation. Uh, there's some interesting things going on in, in mass transit. I've had the opportunity to visit uh, the Hyperloop facility. Mm -hmm. um, and my question to you is, and, and get, even getting back to the gentleman's question about P50 versus P65, you know, I see that as a way to be more efficient and effective uh, at the agency to make sure that we're not getting cost overruns and those taxpayer dollars are uh, handled more uh, in, better in the taxpayer's interest. So where do you see as far as innovation in the future and ways to lower cost, ways to get um, systems maybe like Hyperloop that take much less right away to build. They can go at ground level. They can be elevated under the ground, through the water. Uh, you know, it looks like there would be a lot less cost and uh, potentially a much safer way to do mass transit. Where, where do you see us heading there? So that technology is still um, in its very infant stages, and so it's, um, it's impossible to predict what that would look like. Uh, what I would say is that there's a lot of other technology that is happening, for instance, with bus rapid transit, uh, where you can do transit signal priority and have a dedicated lane uh, where a lot of people would rather take the bus than sit in their car uh, in traffic when you have a dedicated lane that doesn't stop for a signal and that bus just goes right on by. So there's easier things to do uh, that cost less money. Uh, it also provides a way that it, if and when automation actually comes into the, the market, those types of projects can be a little bit easily, easier converted to automation. And so because they already have a dedicated lane, they already have transit signal priority. So when automation comes into the market, it would actually be a lot easier to do. It's also a lot uh, less that you would have to pay back on a federal investment. Uh, when you talk about light rail, those investments are a lot more expensive. And so buses uh, have a shorter shelf life and a, a much uh, uh, smaller price tag. And so there's a lot of innovation that's happening just in the bus market itself. Thank you for your answer, and I yield back. Uh, the gentleman's question brings to mind the fact that because he's interested in rural areas, that rapid bus, uh, your, to deal with your answer, uh, would help rural and urban areas since many of those who are coming from rural areas are coming into the city. So that's an important question. Um, Ms. Ms. Craig. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Administrator Williams, the FDA has been a very strong federal partner for the state and local efforts in Minnesota to develop safe, efficient mass transit, including in my district. Just two weeks ago, the FDA announced the release of the last remaining tranche of funds. I believe it was $74 million for the Orange Line uh, BRT that provides seven-day-a-week service to residents of Minneapolis, Richfield, Bloomington, uh, and in my district, Burnsville. This is our region's first such small starts grant and the last, uh, excuse me, the latest grant agreement that our state and local partners have reached with the FTA since 2011. Getting to, to this point took years of cooperation and communication between one federal agency, 
three state agencies, two counties, five cities, and one regional transit provider. So I'm sure that was incredibly uh, complex and complicated. I'm a strong supporter of these types of federal, state, local partnerships. What can FDA, uh, FTA do to ensure that the application, approval, and grant making process is as simple and efficient as possible for state and local uh, partners who apply for these funds? I think you know our, our team, our professional career staff that work with our grant sponsors uh, are terrific. Uh, I've worked for two other presidents in four other departments, and I've never seen a more committed staff, a more professional staff. They work tirelessly to make sure that the grantees understand what is expected and what information they need. Um, we have a great working relationship with the Met Council. Uh, they're great about bringing all their project partners in to, to see us. They're great about value capture. Um, and so we have an excellent working relationship, and I think um, that's why you see that they've had success in our program. That's fantastic. Um, Ms. Williams, there are other BRT projects that I'm incredibly supportive of in the region. I'm particularly mm -hmm. optimistic about the Red Rock Corridor, uh, which would connect the Twin Cities to Hastings and Cottage Grove, two mm -hmm. other cities in my congressional district. However, the President's uh, full year 20 budget request called for cuts to vital mass transit programs, including sharp cuts to the Capital Investment Grants Program. This comes on the heels of previous budget requests that would have eliminated the CIG program entirely. Fortunately, the House passed a transportation appropriations bill that would fund the CIG program at necessary levels. How can Congress continue to work with the FTA to ensure that the FTA continues to fund critical projects as metro regions continue to expand? How can we best advocate to the White House and OMB for the CIG program that is so vital to communities around the country? I think, you know, in the beginning of the administration, uh, there was no allocation for CIG in the president's budget, and I think you see a difference in the FY 2020 budget of an allocation of $500 million in our, uh, in our, in our budget request by the president. Um, I think that is what we believe um, we need for new projects. The total is $1.5 billion, so it funds all the full funding grant agreements currently in place as well as what we believe we will need for projects that will be ready. Um, let me assure you also that um, during the 2017 and 18 timeframe, that even though the President's request was not for any new funding, uh, the Department did follow the intent of Congress and fund projects. Uh, I believe it was three in 2017 and 10 in 2018. So I want to make sure that we are on the record that even though the request was zero, uh, none of those projects were canceled or not funded or, or set aside. I appreciate that very much. And uh, with that, Ms. Williams, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you, Ms. Craig. Mr. Balderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Ms. Williams. Good, good afternoon, almost. Um, thank you for being here uh, this morning. Um, you're here as the acting administrator of the FTA, but you're also the deputy administrator of the FTA. You have the task of doing two jobs, which I think you're doing very well. I think it would help speed up projects in the CIG program if we had an administrator confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So, when did the Trump administration submit to Congress its nominee to head the FTA? I believe it was in January of 18. Okay, thank and you. And was resubmitted again in the new Congress, I believe. Okay, thank you. I know my colleague from New Jersey raised the issue earlier, but to clarify, what is the status of the nomination? As far as I know, it's still pending before the Senate. Okay. Uh, I hope my colleagues in the Senate move quickly uh, with your nomination. Uh, I agree with the, my colleague from New Jersey. I would support you. Uh, my next question is, um, as you know, I'm, Columbus, Ohio was selected as the winner of the Department of Transportation's first ever Smart City Challenge in 2016. The program's acceleration fund has since leveraged hundreds of millions of dollars in private sector contributions and investments, and is a national model for how public-private partnerships should operate. A 
According to the list of current CIG projects, nearly all the projects are in large or medium-sized cities. In your experience, how are these areas better equipped to receive outside funding and resources than rural areas, which we've touched on a lot here this morning? I think, you know, in large urban cities, we're still working with uh, grant sponsors to to remind them the value that transit brings and to capture that value. I think, um, to your point, you know, there's a lot of value that, that your project has captured. And so knowing that we work with developers uh, to develop around transit, you just need to look outside my window at the USDOT and see the massive amounts of development in Southeast that was completely different 30 years ago when I was here um, before. And so there is a value that it brings. And sometimes you, you merely have to ask the question, but we're not always, um, you know, we're, we're not used to having to ask that question. And so we're trying to make sure that, that uh, grantees understand that and bring more private participation to the table. Um, my follow-up question to that, you, you, you kind of touched on it there with that answer, but why should the Department of Transportation encourage leverage of such funds in the future? We also seen that when projects are funded with local, state, and private contributions, they have a better chance of success because you have the community involvement and support. And so we like to see that blend of funding in addition to the federal grants and loan support as well. We have found that those projects are the most uh, successful in our program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that answer. And Madam Chair, I yield back my remaining time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Balderson. Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Administrator Williams. Improving our nation's roads, bridges, and overall surface infrastructure is of the utmost importance to both maintaining our economic competitiveness and advancing safety. I must say I was disappointed when the administration's fiscal year 2020 budget request only included $500 million in funding for new transit projects under the Capital Investment Grant Program. This is significantly less than both the authorized level and recent appropriations. While this budget, for the first time in this administration, proposes funding for new transit projects, the funding level for the program and for new projects is substantially lower than what our current needs are. Can you help me understand how the administration arrived at this number of 500 million? And two, what projects would receive funding should Congress provide the requested amount? So let me unpack that a bit. The, the first question you asked is how we arrived at the 500 million. That is something our technical team looks at as we craft our budget, and that is the number we thought was appropriate for what we believe may be ready in fiscal year 2020. It's difficult to gauge because many of the um, issues that need to be resolved are local issues like third-party agreements, uh, having all their non-CIG funding secured. Um, so those are things that are outside of our purview, so we try to estimate what will be ready, and we believe that that's the right number. Um, the 500 million is also paired in our budget with another 500 million um, out of the general fund that is above the FAST Act level. 250 million of that is for buses and bus facilities in recognition that our bus fleets are aging across the country and that it is, it is important to look at that in the overall infrastructure uh, program, and you're not just looking at rail, but also in our bus fleets. And secondly, another $250 million for our state of good repair needs, which is a formula program, because we have a $90 billion backlog in the industry of state of good repair. So it was a balance of we need to perhaps build and expand transit, but we also need to ex take care of what we have of our existing projects and, and, and transit systems. And so it was a, a way to balance those both. Thank you. Um, I couldn't help but to um, heed the, um, uh, the observation or the comment you made earlier about a good healthy mix of revenue for various projects actually lends itself to making them better candidates. So, by that logic, I'm pretty sure that California is going to get its fair share. And my district in particular, who has um, voted with 
almost an 80 percent uh, vote to approve self-help uh, tax measures is actually going to be at the front of the line now. So I look forward to uh, scoring as high as possible with all these uh, grant programs so that we could get our fair share to the 24th Congressional District in California. Thank you very much. Congressman, let me assure you of the 15 construction grants, uh, six of them are in only two states, one of which is California. So. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I yield back. Well, I'm very envious of that answer. You said that before. <laughs> I don't know if it's the size of California, but I know when people hear that, they want to know why there aren't more in their states. Either California's doing something right or there must be some other uh, response. Uh, I understand that there are no more questions. I want to thank you, Ms. Williams, for your testimony. Your comments have been very helpful. You have indicated that you would be back to us as we ask for uh, more information. So I appreciate your very knowledgeable testimony. And you are dismissed, and I'm going to call the next and last panel. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could I ask Mr. Bob Alger, the president and CEO of Lane Construction Corporation, uh, to come forward? He is testifying on behalf of the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. Mr. John Jaron, of the, the executive director, Kansas City Streetcar Author Authority, and um, Scootalus, your t um, of I'm sorry. Uh, Paul Scootless, the president and CEO of the American Public Transportation Association. I want to thank all of you for being, being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. Uh, without objection, our witnesses' full statement will be included in the record since your written testimony has been made a part of the record. The subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Mr. Alger, you may proceed. Chairman Norton and Ranking Member Davis, thank you for convening today's hearing. I am Bob Elger, Chairman of the Lane Construction Corporation, and I am here today in my role as Chairman of the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, or ARTBA. Our association's members design, build, manage, and operate all modes of transportation infrastructure projects. My company has direct experience with projects supported by the Tr Transit Capital Investment Grant Program. Madam Chairman, there has been a lot of talk about a federal invest infrastructure initiative since the 2016 presidential campaign. If you take anything away from my remarks, it's, it's this. Now is the time to act on our nation's infrastructure needs, and this process begins with fixing the Highway Trust Fund. I am pleased to talk about the Federal Transit Administration's Capital Investment Grant Program, but I am also here to tell you that Congress' chronic failure to fix the Highway Trust Fund Program threatens all federal surface transportation programs, including transit projects. The next Highway Trust Fund crisis looms shortly after the FAST Act expires in less than 15 months. Rather than repeat the past dysfunctions that led to $140 billion in general fund transfers and budget gimmicks, President Trump, congressional leaders, and members of this committee must seize the initiative and fix the Highway Trust Fund shortfall once and for all. Here are three approaches for your consideration. Raise the federal gasoline and diesel user fee rates. Apply a freight-based user fee to heavy trucks and institute a fee to ensure electric vehicle users also help pay for the system from which they benefit. While ARBA believes these options are the most viable in the short term, we are open to any user-based recurring revenue solutions that would support increased federal highway and public transportation investment. Many of the same complications we face when delivering a highway project are also prevalent on public transportation projects as well. And these obstacles cost American taxpayers time and money. According to FTA's capital cost database, which compiles as-built cost for 54 federally funded transit projects, average cost for delivering these projects increases an average of 5% annually. As such, a project that cost $100 million in 2019 would cost $163 million to build in 2029. This annual increase is more than twice the rate of general inflation, which is estimated to increase at an annual rate of 2.4% over the next 10 years,
according to the Congressional Budget Office. Users of the system will also have to wait longer for the economic benefit from the increased access to services, job creation, and other activities. And depending on the project, delays can far exceed the 5% annual increase projection. My company recently completed work on a project that went from under three years projected completion to nearly four years. The increase in cost for that single year amounted to nearly 20% cost increase. My written testimony includes a host of recommendations for meaningful improvements to the regulatory and project delivery process. I'd like to highlight a few of them. Public transportation projects have previously been allowed to use federal, fund, federal loan programs such as TIFIA as local match. Recent denial of such flexibility has delayed some critically important projects, which only increases their eventual cost and schedule. Since the loans are repaid with local dollars, they should be allowed to be counted as local match. Another key factor in keeping transportation construction projects on schedule are the use of dispute resolution boards. These entities should include members recommended by the project owner, contractor, or industry, and should set up quick and efficient timelines for, so that members can carefully follow its progress. Previous federal surface transportation laws included provisions to expedite the proje project approval process. Due to lack of application and awareness of these reforms by project sponsors, the permitting process time horizon has not substantially approved. It's time to take the next step to ensure these tools are utilized to deliver the transportation benefits Americans need. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. ARBA and its members look forward to working with you and your colleagues on these ideas and others to make the Capital Investment Grant Program more effective and preserve its important contributions to the mobility of all Americans. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alger, for that very, um, very uh, <laughs> uh, uh, important testimony. I just want to say before I move on to Mr. Jaron that it's interesting and important to note that the first part of your testimony was about fixing the highway trust fund and I think a well-placed critique of the Congress uh, for not doing so even though this is about the CIG program. Nevertheless, it seems to me that that's an admonition you were well-placed to give Congress and I appreciate your suggestions on the user fee raised, that's where there's been disagreement between my colleagues on the other side and, and on this side. I couldn't agree more on electric vehicles. You had a third one that seemed all very helpful. I just had to note that because the fact that you de detoured from your testimony to discuss the Highway Trust Fund, I think, sends a message to this committee how important it is to get something done on raising the gas tax and moving along hasn't been done in more than 20 years. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Tom Jaron if he would now offer his testimony. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the committee and members of our Kansas City Regional Delegation. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. My name is Tom Garand, and I have the honor of serving as the executive director of the Kansas City Streetcar Authority in Kansas City, Missouri. Today I come before you on behalf of our regional partnership to share a bit about our local history, our experience, and our aspirations and suggestions related to the Capital Investment Grant Program in the hopes that these comments prove insightful in your committee deliberations and support our collective efforts to make these programs and more importantly the resulting projects the best they can possibly be. Our Kansas City story is not unique. It is one built on a history of regional collaboration and strong and productive local and federal partnerships. Thanks to great work by our friends at the City of Kansas City, Missouri, Mayor Sly James, the City Council, our Streetcar Authority Board of Directors, and the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority, and my good friend Robbie Mackinnon, uh, we have now ignited a transit renaissance that is reshaping and reconnecting our city like never, never before. So why is this important to Kansas City and other cities across the, the country? It's incredibly important to us because we believe there is no more impactful way of connecting people to opportunity and building livable, sustainable, and prosperous cities for the next 50 years than through coordinated and well-executed public transportation investments. Our Kansas City Streetcar Starter Line is an example of this success. 
which opened in 2016 thanks to a federal partnership outside of the CIG program with surface transportation and then Tiger funds. In three short years of operations, the $100 million investment has produced more than $3 billion in economic activity, a 30 to one return on our collective investments, has attracted more than 30% of our residents uh, now to public transportation than previously uh, uh, existed. And now over six million trips to date have redefined how residents, visitors, and employees experience and move around our city. But as strong as our regional partnerships have been, they have only been successful in delivering projects due to the ability and opportunity to leverage well-placed and adequately funded Federal Transportation Administration programs that have made these projects a reality. Without programs like Capital Investment Grant Program, these projects would simply not be possible. Since 2005, we have successfully funded and advanced three small bus rapid transit projects through the CIG program, and we have one streetcar extension that's now moving through the New Starts pipeline. Our most recent grant award was for Prospect Max BRT, which Acting Administrator Jane Williams was kind enough to come to for the groundbreaking in October of this past year, and that project is now under construction and moving towards opening. This is all to say we have some experience in Kansas City navigating the CIG program, so I'm pleased to be here today to just share a few, uh, a few points. Uh, the first point, the importance of the program itself. As I previously mentioned, the existence of a well-supported and adequately funded CIG program is critical to the advancement and modernization of our transit system in Kansas City and systems across the country. Without CIG, and other federal programs, an active and engaged federal partnership, uh, these most prominent and impactful transfer, transportation projects constructed really in our city's history would not have been possible. And the economic opportunity, the investment, and the community re revitalization and the benefits would have been lost. Uh, secondly, the CIG program is rigorous, but we have received strong support from the FTA and specifically our Region 7 office at every step. We thank the current Acting Administrator Williams and the Region 7 Administrator Mahti Ahmad for the great support. Um, without their efforts, uh, we would not have the success that we've had over the course of the year. And not surprisingly, moving through complicated programs like CIG, which are ever evolving, uh, provides some revelations and some, some learnings at every step. So a few points in closing that I would touch on as we think about how to improve the program together uh, as we move forward. Uh, we would support the administration's efforts on process streamlining. We have advanced successfully projects outside of CIG that we think would have cost significantly more resource and money and time if they would have been advanced through the CIG program. Uh, there are opportunities, there are successful projects that we think serve as an example for how we can, how we can in fact do this. Uh, we think these CIG th thresholds and categories uh, frankly, could be reevaluated. There's an opportunity to reintroduce the very small starts program, specifically targeting and allowing small projects the ability to move quickly through the process. And then lastly, uh, project due diligence. There is an incredible burden placed on local governments to advance due diligence on the front end of these processes with local funding at risk prior to acknowledgement of a federal grant. So opportunities to formalize a federal partnership earlier in the process would no doubt make it easier on local governments uh, to bring good projects, as well as to fund the local contribution that's, that's necessary to see the projects to the end. In closing, I want to thank you for your interest and support of the CIG program, and I want to lift up those on the committee and FTA that are doing the hard work to make this program the best it can be. These, project, these, pro, these programs and this project, these projects benefit communities like Kansas City greatly. Uh, we thank you immensely for your support, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Jaron. Mr. Paul Scutalis, President and CEO of American Public Transpo Transportation Association. Mike, please. Mike. I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Chairman Norton, uh, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the Subcommittee on Highways and Transit. Thanks for this opportunity to testify today on the capital investment grants, which are critically important to help growing communities address their mobility needs and to expand public transit throughout our nation. My name is Paul Scutellis. I'm the President Chief Executive Officer of APTA, the American Public Transportation Association. We're the only association in North America that represents all modes of public transport. Our 1,500 
public and private sector member organizations speak with one voice in terms of uh, making the case for public transit in the industry. Capital investment grants are a vital source of capital funding to expand our public transit services. Over the past decade, more than one half of all the states have benefited from CIG projects. The economic benefits of projects funded through CIG are very wide ranging. In addition to the critical local economic benefits of CIG projects themselves, the vehicles, the equipment, the supplies that comprise of these projects are made in America and states all across the nation. As an example, I point to the rail and bus manufacturing schematics that are appended to my written testimony. These schematics show how dozens of states contribute to each rail car that's manufactured in America and to each bus that's made as well. Capital investment grants are a critical tool to addressing the mobility needs of our communities and to helping them grow and grow the national economy. Unfortunately, over the past two decades, we have seen both Congress and FTA have layered additional requirements on the CIG process that have resulted in a bureaucratic maze. As a result, CIG requirements are vastly more complex, more time consuming, and more burdensome than they need to be. And there are more requirements of these projects than comparable large US DOT transportation discre discretionary grant programs. Moreover, these burdensome requirements cause significant delay in project approvals, which result in considerable increases in project costs. Today, a CIG, a CIG project sponsor, typically a transit agency, faces almost 60,000 words of federal statutory law, regulations, and administrative guidance that's required under the program. In comparison, a federal aid highway infra grant applicant faces less than one quarter of the statutory language and no specific regulations. The bureaucratic maze is not only a burden for CIG project sponsors, but also affects local decision making as communities must then weigh whether to proceed with a CIG transit project with all of its requirements or alternatively to build perhaps a highway project that has much more limited requirements. Although we've got a great partnership with FTA, this is an area of great concern for us and some disagreement. And I wanna say for the record, that we have a terrific partnership with the FTA and with Administrator Williams. We work together hand in hand on a daily basis, as do our members. But this is an area of CIG that we have a striking difference of opinion. With regard to funding, while we encourage that the administration express support this year for the CIG program in the president's budget, we strongly urge Congress to provide funding at, a, at or above the FY19 enacted level of $2.6 billion. Additionally, we encourage Congress to continue to require FTA to obligate these funds. Of the 2.6 billion that Congress provided for capital investment grants in fiscal 19, more than one half, some $1.3 billion has not yet been even allocated, let alone obligated to specific projects. I can assure you there's no shortage of interest in these vital grants. There are 10 new start and core capacity projects under full funding grant agreements today, and 53 additional projects in the CIG pipeline in 20 different states seeking $27 billion of CIG funds. We urge FTA to move forward as expeditiously as possible to use the available fiscal 18 and 19 funds to invest in these critical projects. Many NAFTA members have expressed concerns that FTA is strongly encouraging significant local overmatch of the federal CIG share, particularly for New START projects. These project sponsors believe that DOT will not move forward with their New START project unless the project sponsor accepts significantly less than a 50% CIG share. This significant overmatch can require projects in the in a pipeline to redo their budgets, causing delays, and could in fact discourage project sponsors from seeking the CIG grant at all. CIG overmatch can also affect local community decisions I mentioned as a moment ago, the decision between do I invest through the myriad of requirements for a CG, CIG project or do I look for another alternative. APTA is also concerned with the policies outlined in FTA's 2018 Dear Colleague letter. Again, as we have a great partnership with FTA, this is an area that we regret the agency, FTA, did not consult with the public transit industry prior to making these significant policy changes. The Dear Colleague letter has created considerable confusion among project sponsors regarding certain policies. For instance, 
Sponsors remain confused on DOT's new treatment of TIFIA. To eliminate that confusion, we urge Congress to clarify that TIFIA loans repaid with non-federal funds are indeed local match. That shouldn't be an issue of contention. At the time of the Dear Colleague letter, FTA also announced changes to its evaluation of CIG projects. Specifically, FTA now conducts risk assessments much earlier in the process. Prior to joining APTA as President and CEO last year, 2018, I was directly involved in delivering capital investment projects on both the public side and the private sector side. Conducting risk assessments too early in the process can be problematic because at that point, project sponsors have not yet performed an adequate level of design and engineering to fully calculate the likely risks. Similarly, increasing the probability threshold percentage requires project sponsors to have large amounts of local funding on hand as project contingencies. As many local elected officials know and transit governing members know, it's difficult to find the extra dollars oftentimes. Moreover, given that the federal share is established upon entry into engineering, significant costs of contingencies and the risk and responsibility are pushed to the project sponsor. Thus, we urge Congress to reverse the Dear Colleague and risk assessment changes. Finally, APTA strongly urges the committee to conduct a zero-based review of the CIG program to assess all statutory, regulatory, and administrative requirements through what I would describe as a two-part test. First, does the requirement strengthen the CIG program and ensure that beneficial projects across the country are delivered in a timely manner? Second, does the requirement protect the taxpayer's interest in funding good projects? We strongly believe that dozens of current CIG requirements do not meet this test. In addition to a zero-based review, we recommend four additional policy reforms to strengthen the CIG program. First, establish a CIG pipeline dashboard where FTA must report on the progress and status of its projects at each milestone so that stakeholders, decision makers, elected officials, and the public understand how these projects are moving through the pipeline. Second, codify a fixed federal share to provide certainty for project sponsors for CIG projects. Third, clarify the TIFIA loans, as I mentioned, are indeed local match. Fourth, reverse the 2018 risk assessment changes, which really do not add to project certainty and create more delays. On behalf of APTA, I thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify and to share our thoughts on capital investment grants. We look forward to continuing to work with this committee, with the FTA, and the industry to strengthen the CIG program and ensure that these critically needed public transportation improvements are delivered in a timely manner. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Skoudalas. Uh, I must say your figure, <laughs> when I hear a figure like that, 1.3 billion, I believe it was not allocated. You know, I'm not used to that kind of money floating around the Congress and nobody making use of it. Um, could I ask you, Mr. Skoudalas, um, you indicated, I believe, that there was no consultation before the changes in TIFIA uh, and risk assessment um, no regulation, no regulatory change is required for that there, kind of change? There, there was none. There was none, and we think it's vitally important as the industry. Again, I, not to take anything away from the FTA staff and their expertise, and I commented on that previously, uh, a lot of expertise lies within the project sponsors themselves, and we have a lot to offer because the, the individual members and sponsors are on the front lines delivering these projects. And so I think an order of consultation, an opportunity for the industry to input uh, would be highly appropriate. That's the usual rule in the Congress. You can make all kinds of mistakes by, by not consulting. And, and if that's not required by regulation, we will have to make sure in the 2020 reauthorization that the appropriate statutory change is made. Very helpful suggestions. Uh, I tried to get at, for example, your notion of reporting on the status when I asked uh, the acting administrator to get back to me, but your detailed, your, your further detail will be very helpful to us in submitting questions to her uh, following this hearing. Uh, I'm trying to understand these different programs. So you have one program, the DOT discretionary program, and then we have this program, which 
uh, it seems to be far more complicated. Uh, and I, I believe, I'm trying to understand uh, how one being more complicated than the other uh, of course, the CIG program encourages local communities to build uh, on the program, using the program that is least complicated, which turns out to be the highway program. Does that result in, in, uh, mis uh, 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 in, in, in localities making decisions it would not otherwise make? Uh, all of you, Mr. Scootless, why don't well, we start I, I with certainly you? think that that's a strong possibility. I think it discourages, to some degree, projects from getting into the pipeline uh, once they see some of the daunting requirements. The demand is great from communities because the, this is a valuable resource of funding that's important for them to build important projects like bus rapid transit or extensions to light rail and the like. Um, Local governments make judgments and where they're going to put their money, and certainly the agencies themselves have to make that, that decision. Do they ask for federal dollars? Do they not? Which projects do they support? My only point to that is I think there needs to be a level playing field. There's no, there's no basis to require a full set of more um, demanding requirements on one mode versus another, and I think that would be something that Congress ought to look at, and let's level the playing field. Let's make it uh, equally appropriate in terms of what has to be done to implement these projects. I think that would serve us very well. Uh, do, do either of you have views on, on that notion? I'm sure the, the projects went different ways for different reasons. They have very different authorizations. But you ha do you have any response on Madam that Chair, question? I'll, I will give you the, the perspective from Kansas City. As, as mentioned in my comments, we advanced our three-car starter line project outside of CIG, it was $102 million. We leveraged a, a federal partnership through the Surface Transportation Program, and then Tiger now build uh, for some supplemental uh, federal match. So FTA oversaw uh, the implementation of that program outside of CIG, and that was advantageous to the timeline of that project, which we completed really in record time from, in, in under five years from planning to, to full-blown operations with satisfactory, obviously, oversight and a really successful launch. We're now in uh, full-blown new starts uh, through our uh, streetcar extension and, and really are noticing clearly uh, the differences in the requirements, despite the fact that we've successfully deployed an initial project. And with my background on the regional transportation side, I would say in all cases, frankly, the rigor of the, of the CIG program is unlike any other federal transportation grant program um, across any of the categories that we've had experience with in Kansas City, and, um, and frankly, an order of magnitude more complicated than similarly funded roadway projects, highway projects, and the like that we are continuously advancing throughout the region. So it's an impediment to progress. It is where the money is, frankly, for large-scale capital uh, transit projects. So we play by the rules. Um, we understand that they're rigorous, and we expect that that is, comes, comes with the territory, but, but there is a front-end local financial commitment that's very real in these processes. The federal obligation and commitment for partnership is at the very back end of the process. So as indicated, uh, we may be spending upwards of $20 million of local funds uh, developing a project concept before we know we have a federal partnership that's real and can actually implement a project. That's a tough pill for local governments to swallow, uh, but it, it comes with with the territory, and so we are in a position of having to make that decision, and, and we're doing that, because that's, that, it's a competitive framework, but it is, uh, it is challenging, and the due diligence and the burden on sponsors is very real. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Yeah, yeah this is very difficult. I, the, one program is more complicated than another, just because Congress is set out. One is a grant program, the other was always meant to give a lot of discretion uh, to the jurisdictions. So in reauthorization, we will have to look more closely at making the CIG program uh, easier to deal with uh, at level of the administration as well as with grantees. Uh, ranking member, I'm pleased to recommend, uh, to recognize our ranking member, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the witnesses. Uh, sorry. We didn't have a little bigger crowd, but you got the best of the best with us three here, I would say. <laughs> um, hey, look, I, first off, Mr. Uh, Guerin, uh, 
Now, the Kansas City streetcar, I know that's probably in my colleague, Ms. David's district, but I gotta know, does it go to Worlds of Fun? It does not, not yet, no. Okay, is, is that in your long-term planning? Uh, that is part of our multimodal strategy to extend beyond streetcar, it's, it's, it's multimodal, multimodal bus on-demand transit services, of course. As somebody who was born in Des Moines, Iowa, our closest city outside of Des Moines to go have fun at when I was young was Kansas City, and I, I remember the worlds of fun uh, was my favorite place to go. So is that in your district, Ms. Davids? Is it across the state line? Oh, it's in Missouri? Okay, well, hey, you know what's good? It's projects like that that can transcend state lines, uh, <laughs> if needed, if needed. Well, uh, first off, I wanna thank all the witnesses, and you know, we've talked about the CIG program, the panel before with the acting administrator, and now with you. And I get we've got some issues between the discretionary portion versus some of the the the, the normal applicant portions of, of CIG. And, and I think the as acting administrator uh, answered a lot of the concerns very well. But I've got an overall concern on this panel, overall concern with how do we actually get to a bipartisan solution to reauthorize the FAST Act? And the biggest concern I have is, are we at TNI going to have to pass a bill that we know is not adequately funded, like the last one, for the entirety of the policy recommendation period? How do we get to a point where we have a fully funded highway reauthorization? What do we do? You know, there, there are many uh, that have, have taken a, a strict increase in our current revenue stream off the table. So what's the next step, Mr. Alger? What's the next step to actually ensure that we not only make the Highway Trust Fund uh, solvent, we make it viable, we make it uh, less volatile, and how do we bring in new modes of transportation that may not be paying into the Highway Trust Fund now, but it may be more of a ubiquitous part of our roadways in the future? Well, I think there's a couple of points here. Number one, all transportation in the United States is interrelated. Whether if we don't fund transit, then more people are gonna go on the roads on cars and we're gonna have more trucks. We're gonna have all kinds of problems, more congestion, people trying to get where they're trying to get to. So there has to be a solution for everything. I almost think that we're making this too complicated. We're trying to get in this- In Congress, to, really? Really, I truly yeah. believe that. So this $2 trillion Shocked. that everybody's talking about, I almost think we need to take smaller bites of the apple. There's a lot of things out there that we could do that we could raise the gas tax today. We could, we could do some other things that have been proposed. We, we sat this morning and there's like 10 or 12 different items that are available to be done today that we could do. But we just can't seem to get everybody together. One comment that, that I had when I met with a couple members of Congress was, why can't we just get everybody in one room like this and we lock the doors until somebody figures out what the hell we're gonna do. Because it just doesn't seem to happen around here. If it was private industry, we'd come with a solution, we'd get it together, we'd move, we'd move forward. For some reason, this thing just gets bottlenecked and I, and I don't get it. There's a lot of things we could do right now that we just choose not to do, whether it's bipartisan or not. And it's, it's foolish. Well, I, I appreciate the comments. You know, as, as somebody who is, has said, I think it's extremely short-sighted just to just to use the existing revenue sources that we have because same federal government tells auto manufacturers to make engines that burn less gas. So we're not providing a long-term less volatile solution. Um, you have any ideas how we bring electric vehicles into the mix? I, I wanna sell more electric vehicles. I've got a, an old Mitsubishi factory that shut down that's in my district a few years ago sure. that's now got a few hundred million dollars of investment, a Rivian car company and investment from Ford Motor Company, Amazon and others, hundreds of millions of dollars. They want to produce small SUVs and small light electric pickups. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as we look ahead over the next five to six years, 10 years, I, I believe more of those will be on the roadway and I certainly hope so because it'll, it'll provide jobs to my constituents. But what do we do since, you know, any of you drive a fully electric vehicle up there? I don't have an automobile, I, okay. I, take, I take the bus. All right, well, I can't do that in my district. Uh, so nobody drives a fully electric vehicle up on the panel, right? I do not, but I think that we could put a tax on electric vehicles so that they 
pay for the roads that they're using from the, that the gas-powered cars are using. They're, they're using the same facilities. They should pay for using those facilities just like everybody else does. Right. Well, Can I offer a comment? I, first of all, I want to thank you for your leadership on this whole issue, and, and you've come and spoken to our group uh, in, in recent months, uh, and you've made the strong case that there needs to be action taken. Certainly, from the standpoint of the, the transportation industry, and there's almost an, an incredible alignment between the associations and virtually everyone that recognizes we need to take this bold step forward for infrastructure investment. Uh, it's a great opportunity that we have. Yes, there might be some issues. Is it a gas tax? Is it some blend? Is it a tax on electric vehicles? That seemingly is something we should be able to get over uh, and, and to, to cause some kind of a blending. Uh, in my own personal opinion, I believe that perhaps that is the future uh, of a tax on, on electric vehicles. Unfortunately, there's not enough of them yet to make a difference, uh, and yet it probably needs to be in, in the horizon of when that can happen. Um, but I would hope that given the, the, the great demands that we have in our communities across the board, across the multimodal nature of infrastructure, that we can find a way to come together to get it done. Um, it, as Bob said here, uh, it's not, it shouldn't be that difficult. I know it is, but it shouldn't be that difficult. And we stand here to help however way we can to assist in that. Well, thank you all. I, I know I have no time to yield back, and I, I want to thank Mr. Guerin, too, for the long-term plans of extending the streetcar to uh, one of the greatest amusement parks of my childhood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back nothing. Well, I want, I want to thank the ranking member for his uh, important questions. I do want to note that <laughs> once uh, Mr. Alger raised the uh, Highway Trust Fund, it brought the ranking member back, who, who has other business, but he came right back to the table because I think, like his questions indicated, you see a bipartisan, uh, a, a bipartisan desire to do something about the Highway Trust Fund. He seems to have taken off raising the gas tax, but he didn't take off your other two suggestions, uh, Mr. Alger. And if I may record for the record, I believe the number is two-thirds of the states have raised their gas tax. 31. 31 states, that's more than two thirds. So, I, the, so the problem is in the Congress. It looks like nobody would be punished if we did at the federal level what the states have already done at their level. I'm not sure whether we're afraid of our own shadow. I believe that there's, I think it's 96%. I think it's 96% of the people um, that have been elected to Congress have voted for a gas tax and got reelected. It's something like that. So people should not be scared to vote to raise the gasoline tax. It's about the same as the incumbent retention rate all around. Well, we may have to find some way to get a vote on that matter on the, or, or at least to, to, to uh, test, uh, to test, to do a kind of whip count and see if we put the figures that the ranking member just gave and that I just gave before people whether we might get another result. We could do a whip, whip count and see whether we're simply going off of what we've done for more than 20 years and, and that with these new figures, states may have updated their own thinking about it. If I may, it's very frustrating on our part to, to talk about this for the last nine months to a year and see absolutely nothing get done. It's really frustrating from industry, from the associations, from the general public. And uh, it seems like we have the opportunity now, potentially. Um, now we need to seize that opportunity and make something happen. Thank you very much. Ms. Ms. Davids. Well, thank you to the witnesses for being here today. I appreciate uh, the testimony you provided in writing and then uh, listening to um, the suggestions that you have. So, uh, of course, I definitely want to talk to Mr. Jaron about the not just the Kansas City streetcar, but uh, the regional collaboration that, that has happened across the state lines, which I think is one of the most, has been one of the most beneficial things to our area in terms of economic vitality and growth that we've seen over the last number of years. I want to, I want to just dig right into some of the recommendations that you made. There are two really big things that jump out at me. and. We have very limited time for each person to testify, so I wanted to jump into the very smart, very small starts program. 
and your recommendation of, of reintroducing that uh, as part of the CIG. And could you just really quickly talk about where you think, why you think that would be beneficial and what it would look like? Sure, um, thank you for the question. And it's a pleasure seeing you this morning. Uh, we had some experience in the, in the Kansas City region with our Truce Max BRT project and deploying uh, that then was the Very Small Starts program, which was designed to help small scale projects with high community benefits move through the process sort of on an expedited timeline with, with minimal requirements. These are lower risk projects, so there's lots of conversation in the room today about uh, small cities, about rural communities. Uh, we definitely think as we look at even the small starts requirements and, and the burden placed on projects, even through the small starts pipeline, that there's a smaller, the smaller end of the, the projects in that spectrum, there's an opportunity to once again carve those out, create a, another, pro, another category effectively for the small, small starts projects, the very small starts projects, that could help expedite and move low risk projects with high benefits at a faster pace. It's worked well in the past, we think it's an opportunity, it's worth revisiting that. And so when we think about those high community benefits, it kind of sparks the, the next recommendation. Uh, so that was, or takeaway. Uh, the second takeaway was what you were just speaking about. And then the third takeaway, which has to do with the project due diligence and um, part two, I really get into these things. Part two of the, um, the due diligence takeaway has to do with the way that the federal government looks at the local commitment. And, you know, you specifically mentioned the, I remember seeing this go through, the uh, voter-approved tax to, you know, to secure funding for projects. And, um, and some of the other things that ha have happened in the region that demonstrate a local commitment to investing in these projects and then to still not have that count can you talk a little bit about what do you think we need to do to make sure that when the people who are on the ground doing what they're supposed to be doing and committing uh, to projects in very real ways still are not, they're not getting that credit in these, in these programs? Sure, uh, happy to elaborate. So the comment in my statement, written statement, was really about the requirements to enter into engineering through the New Starts pipeline. And with that comes as was talked about earlier today, some specific requirements related to financial commitments. And many properties around the country are having conversations with FTA about defining commitment. What does that really mean? And so in our case, uh, we're fortunate. We've had a voter approved taxing district dedicated for our expansion effort, past 70 to 30, that included a sales and property tax, it demonstrates the value. Uh, we've had recently, as, as, as it relates to as recently as last week, city council formal ordinances and agreements approved. It really is though an ongoing conversation with FTA about um, uh, what the acting director's comments were related to no additional actions. What specifically does that mean? How does it relate to local processes? How does it relate to state law as it re and, and annual appropriations of, of budgeted resources? So really sort of in the weeds, um, the point that I would really like to make here as it relates to CIG and engineering specifically is that it's still a action and it's authorization and approval and to enter into a phase of the process that still is without a federal commitment. It's not, we're not talking about full funding grant agreement. We're just simply seeking to move into the final phase of the process, the engineering phase, and there's some really high bars as it relates to entering into that phase. So our recommendation as it relates to, to the risk assessment, financial readiness, some of those considerations as we're thinking about streamlining the program we think makes sense to reevaluate and reconsider. Do they really have to be located where they are currently located in the process, or could they be uh, criteria that instead of being held against entry into engineering, are held against a full funding grant agreement? So FTA still has the leverage to require satisfactory responses, but we're not slowing down the projects, and we're utilizing the engineering phase on the back end of the process to fully inform project plans, financial plans, and ultimately, obviously, the local cost share. So all to say, it's part of a really costly and labor-intensive due diligence effort, and we think there's some advantages with deferring some of those requirements to later in the process, and uh, that's what we would suggest uh, the committee consider as you reevaluate long-term opportunities for program uh, streamlining and, and program improvement. 
Thank you. I, thank you very much. I appreciate much. your testimony, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have another round of questions, and I yield to the ranking member, Mr. Davis. Well, thank you all for your comments, and I, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, the chair talk about wanting to have the debate on the long-term solvency of the Highway Trust Fund. I, I look forward to having that debate at this committee, and I look forward to our Ways and Means Committee, our Committee on Revenue, having the debate. But I think we here at TNI can help lead the charge on, on what that debate looks like. And that's why I'm glad you, know, you three are at the table. Uh, I know, Mr. Alger, uh, your organization has put together options. I mean, I've always been for diversification. I mean, I, I enjoy the discussion on political courage on whether or not to cast a vote or take a vote here in Congress. I believe every vote we take has an impact on whether or not we get reelected or elected in the first place. And frankly, you know, many of the issues that we face are gonna be used either for or against any of us. But the bottom line is, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, we take votes based upon what we think is best for policy. And I can tell you there are good men and women that sit on this committee and serve in this Congress that will not put political considerations ahead of doing what's right for this country. I think we all agree that we ought to have a more funded, well-funded, more solvent, less volatile highway trust fund. It's gonna deal with our, our crumbling roads, our crumbling bridges, it's gonna deal with our transit issues, streetcar issues and streetcar extensions. Uh, but we've gotta stop the discussion on politics when it comes to, to issues. You know, I have a distinct concern as a policymaker how do we actually solve the long-term problems that we have in our highway trust fund? I spent 16 years as a congressional staffer working with local communities before I got elected, making sure that they, they knew how to fund their long-term projects. So this highway trust fund problem didn't start when I got here six and a half years ago. It started long before this. And we in this committee have continued to lead in making sure that we put good funding sources, good funding solutions together, but we can do better. Now, I hope all of us in this room agree that the roadways are going to look much different in the next 10 years. Let's look at Europe, for example. President Macron said that in the next 10 years, he doesn't envision any fossil fuel burning vehicle on a roadway in France. You don't think that's going to have an impact on the rest of the EU unless they have a, a Frexit? It's going to be huge. You don't think that's going to come over here? I mean, look, I hope we're selling a lot of Rivian small trucks and SUVs out of my district. We didn't sell enough Mitsubishis, which means that plant shut down. But now it's reopening. So when we look ahead, I want to commend ARTBA for helping to lead the charge in the past. We're hoping to look at diversification. That's leadership. We need to do more of that and less about politics here in this committee. That's what I hope we do here. Now, I mentioned diversification. I got a minute and 37, six seconds left after my three and a half minute filibuster. Who wants to answer what can we do to diversify? Do you agree that we need to diversify, number one? And what do you recommend? Well, I'll take the lead on that. You know, we've had the BOLD Act in place at ARPA for quite some time now. We've been talking about this. As I talked about, 31 states have done some sort of a gas diesel tax increase. It's non-political. It's simple. It's easy. There's nothing, you know, nothing that we should be doing anyways. ARPA members have long been open to user-based growing revenue alternatives to the motor fuels user fee um, to support the nation's aviation in infrastructure system, a 6.25% air cargo tax was imposed in 1972 uh, as a cost of moving goods for transportation. Congress could apply the same concept to surface transportation infrastructure through either a commercial truck air cargo tax co uh, companion or a vehicle miles tax on trucks. And then combining the freight fee with electric user vehicle fees collected on the battery manufacturer's level or as a registration fee like 27 states do now can serve as a strong base alternative to motor fuel tax increases, or very combine the two, and then you've even got two mechanisms that will adjust the tax. 
And, and those are the types of debates that we need to have here. Uh, look, this committee during my time here uh, was asked by the, the, the barge industry, our water resources, our locks and dams, our inland, naviga inland waterway navigation system, it runs through my district in Illinois. It's so important for us to get products out in the global marketplace. They asked for a voluntary fee increase. You know what? They passed unanimously, I, th I believe, out of this committee room. Not one person has been criticized for that because it was working within industry, working within the institution. Now, my biggest problem is, is the Corps of Engineers going to spend that money wisely. We went from no money to wondering what to do. Now we have a surplus wondering if the Corps of Engineers is going to actually invest in upgrading our inland waterway system. That's a good problem to have. We don't have that in highways and bridges and transit right now. But this committee leads. This committee does it, and I look forward to working with the chair to make sure we have good common sense solutions like that coming forward. Mr. Alger, thank you for those other options. Thank you for your time. Uh, and Mr. Uh, Skatelis, Mr. Uh, Guerin, thank you for your time. I, I promise I won't ask another round of questions. I yield back. But that was a very useful round to, to, to close on, and I thank the ranking member. You can see the ranking member is searching uh, for ways to respond to your testimony indicating what is necessary if we're going to proceed. The fact that uh, the uh, issue of, of gas uh, tax increases has become so prominent in this testimony it was not one shunned uh, by the ranking member, but encouraged more questions for him. And I want to assure him that I want to work with him uh, to find a way to get through this conundrum that the states have somehow managed to get through your figure of 31 states. My state, the District of Columbia, has raised this gas tax. I wouldn't be surprised if the ranking member's state has as well. They just doubled it. Just doubled it, he says. Uh, so we, we, we have lots of encouragement from you and from our own jurisdictions. Uh, I want to say to the um, ranking member how much I appreciated his forward-thinking remarks on how Fran France has raised the, uh, we'll get to no fossil fuels in no time flat, uh, because uh, it shows his understanding and concern uh, about climate change, um, indeed about the revenue that could be yielded by doing what France is doing, and that is turning away from fossil fuel to other uh, modes of, um, of, um, of energy. Uh, so I want to indicate, I want to thank you for the I was I was not aware that France was that far ahead of us. Uh, and I want to encourage the ranking member that uh, I would like very much to work with him on this issue as well, which is very much related to our committee. I think the transportation is second in use of fossil fuels in the United States. Uh, if there are no more questions, then I would certainly like to thank our witnesses. You were held overtime because of the interest of the ranking member and me in your testimony. I want to thank each and every one of you for very helpful testimony today. Your contribution has not only stimulated us, but will certainly go into our thinking about the 2020 reauthorization. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided any answers that may have been requested by members or that they themselves may want to submit in writing. I thank the ranking member uh, for his questions and, um, excuse me, um, I ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days. For any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection, so ordered if no other members have anything to add. The, sub the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My goodness, that was.